The Senate will come to order. Will the clerk please call the roll? Senators Baisley, Bridges, excused, Buckner, Senator Buckner, excused, Coleman, Cutter, Senator Cutter, excused, Danielson, Exum. Fields, Senator Fields, excused, Gardner, Janal, Gonzalez, Senator Gonzalez, excused, Hansen, Henriksen, Senator Henriksen, Excused. Hawkers Lewis, Kirkmeyer, Colker, Liston, Lundin, Marchman, Senator Marchman, Excused. Michelson Janay, Malika, Pelton B. Pelton R. Priola. Rich. Roberts. Rodriguez. Simpson. Smallwood. Sullivan. Ben Winkle. Will. Winter. Zenzinger, Senator Buckner, Senator Cutter, Senator Henriksen, Senator Gonzalez, Mr. President. Here. The morning roll call is 32 present, zero absent, three excused. We do have a quorum. Senator Exum, would you please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Please join me in the pledge. Aye. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. Approval of the journal, Senator Van Winkle. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that the Senate Journal for March 27th, 2024 be approved as corrected by the Secretary. You have heard the motion. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it, and the motion is adopted. <laughs> Senate Services. March 28, 2024, correctly printed Senate Resolution 4, correctly engrossed Senate Bills 176, 177, and 178, correctly revised House Bills 1225 and 1248, House Concurrent Resolution 1002, correctly revised House Bills 1097, 1257, and 1277, correctly enrolled Senate Bill 138. Committee reports. March 27, 2024, Committee on Agriculture and Natural Resources. After consideration of the merits, of committee records the following. Senate Bill 38 be postponed indefinitely, and House Bill 10, 1309 be referred to the Committee of the Whole with favorable recommendation and with a recommendation to be placed on the consent calendar. After consider, uh, Committee on Transportation and Energy, after consideration on the merits, the committee recommends the following. Senate Bill 184 be amended as follows, and is so amended be referred to the Committee on Finance with favorable recommendation. Committee on Education, after consideration on the merits, the committee recommends the following. Senate Bill 164 be amended as follows, and is so amended be referred to the Committee of the Whole with favorable recommendation. House Bill 1087 be referred to the Committee of the Whole with favorable recommendation and with recommendation to be placed on the calendar. 
And House Bill 1003 be amended as follows, and so amended be for to the Committee of the Whole with favorable recommendation, and with a recommendation may be placed on the consent calendar. Committee on State Veterans and Military Affairs, after consideration on the merits, of committee recommends the following. Senate Bill 170 be amended as follows, and is so amended be referred to the Committee of the Whole with favorable recommendation. Please. Committee on Health and Human Services, after consideration on the merits, of committee recommends the following. House Bill 1046 be referred favorably to the Committee on Appropriations, and House Bill 1037 be referred to the Committee of the Whole with favorable recommendation. Committee on Education, after consideration on the merits, the committee recommends the following. Senate Bill 188 be amended as follows, and is so amended be referred to the Committee on Appropriations with favorable recommendation. Committee on Judiciary, after consideration on the merits, the committee recommends the following. House Bill 1071 be referred to the Committee of the Whole with favorable recommendation. Senate Bill 136 be amended as follows, and is so amended be referred to the Committee on Finance with favorable recommendation. And Senate Bill 131 be amended as follows, and is so amended be referred to the Committee of the Whole with favorable recommendation. Third reading of bills, consent calendar. Will the clerk please read the title of all of the bills on the consent calendar? House Bill 1225 by Representatives Duran and Lynch and Senators Fields and Gardner concerning procedures in murder in the first degree cases and in connection therewith an exception to the right to bail for cases of murder in the first degree when proof is evident or presumption is great. Will the clerk please add Senator Marchman to the roll? Majority Leader Rodriguez. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that we proceed out of order for a moment of personal privilege. Mr. Majority Leader, we are on thirds. I should pay attention more. <laughs> Mr. Majority Leader. Thank you, Mr. President. I move for the passage of the bill on third reading's final passage consent calendar, which is House Bill 1225. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, the motion is the passage of House Bill 1225 on third reading of bill's consent calendar. Are there any no votes? With a vote of 33 ayes, zero no, zero absent, two excused, House Bill 1225 is passed. Co-sponsors. Senators Janal, Kolker, Henriksen, Cutter, Michelson Janay, Priola. Gonzalez. Minority Leader Lundin. Is your hand up? Sullivan. Sullivan. Smallwood. Kirkmeyer. Exum. Mollica. Roberts. Pelton B. Pelton R. Simpson. Hansen. Liston. Rich. Will. Van Winkle. Buckner. Winter. Marchman. Please add the president. Will the clerk please add Senator Bridges to the roll? Mr. Majority Leader. Thank you, Mr. President. I now request to proceed out of order for a moment of personal privilege. You have heard the motion. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it, and the Senate will now proceed out of order. Senator Baisley. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, Mr. President, we, uh, we would like to introduce uh, a Senate joint resolution. I'm going to, uh, to hand the keys over to the good senator from Greenwood Village to introduce. Senator Bridges. Thank you, Mr. President. I move SJR 11 and ask that it be read at length. Um, Where's the majority leader? 
Mr. Majority. President, uh, it's been a long week. I move that we proceed out of order for a joint resolution. Oh, that's good. For consideration the of resolution. motion is for the Senate to proceed out of order for consideration of resolutions. All those in favor say aye. Opposed, no? The ayes have it. The Senate will not proceed out of order for the purposes of consideration of resolutions. Senator Bridges. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Now that we are properly in order uh, for this motion, uh, I moved it. Do I need to move it again? Yes. Thank you, Mr. President. I move SJR 24-011 and ask that it be read at length. Will the clerk please read Senate Joint Resolution 11 at length? Senate Joint Resolution 11 by Senator Baisley and Representatives Valdez and Soper. Concerning the recognition of Colorado's it's fine. globally competitive quantum technology industry, whereas under the federal Creating Helpful Incentives to Produce Semiconductors, Chips, and Science Act enacted in 2022, the United States Department of Commerce's Economic Development Administration is overseeing the Regional Technology and Innovation Hubs, or Tech Hubs program, a competitive process to select five to 10 federally designated tech hubs across the country with $500 million in appropriated funding available in 2024 and up to $10 billion over five years. And whereas in October 2023, the federal government announced that Colorado was successful in its bid pursuing a regional phase one tech hub designation, enabling our state to compete for new funds to develop the quantum technology industry, the tech hub bid is led by Elevate Quantum, a Colorado-led nonprofit consisting of a consortium of over 70 member organizations across Colorado, New Mexico, and Wyoming, aiming to maintain the Mountain West as the nation's leading quantum ecosystem. And whereas Colorado is currently competing nationally for the Tech Hub program's Phase II Tech Hub designation and accompanying grant for quantum technology, if successful, Colorado will secure the federal funding necessary to develop a global hub for the quantum technology ecosystem, including quantum computing, sensing, networking, and enabling hardware. And whereas Colorado is intentionally recognized for its contributions to quantum physics and is home to four winners of the Nobel Prize in Physics for quantum breakthroughs that shifted global understanding in the field, and whereas Colorado has more quantum startups, more deployed quantum technology, more private sector investments in quantum technology, more employees working for quantum companies, and more overall economic output within the quantum industry than any other state, and whereas Colorado's quantum technology industry has fostered a 40% increase in the number of patents secured over the last 10 years and a 545% increase in the total third-party funding amount over the last five years. And whereas establishing Colorado as the global hub for quantum technology will result in an economic impact of more than a billion dollars statewide and over 10,000 jobs from the phase two tech hub designation alone. And whereas Qu Colorado's quantum technology industry has garnered international recognition for its groundbreaking achievements, positioning the state as a leader in quantum research, development, and innovation, and whereas the collaborative efforts of higher education institutions, industry, and government agencies have played a pivotal role in nurturing Colorado's quantum technology ecosystem, fostering an environment conducive to research advancements, technology deployment to improve quality of life, and economic prosperity for Colorado and our global community. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Senate of the 74th General Assembly of the State of Colorado, the House of Representatives concurring herein, that we, the members of the Colorado General Assembly, one, recognize the growing and competitive position of Colorado's application for designation as a phase two tech hub for quantum technology and acknowledge Colorado's exemplary achievements and strategic initiatives in quantum technology. And two, urge the Economic Development Administration and any additional federal agencies overseeing the phase two tech hubs selection process to support Colorado's achievements and strategic initiatives and consider Colorado for federal designation as a phase two tech hub for quantum technology. Senator Beasley. Thank you, Mr. President. 
Um, members, this is a, an amazing phase in uh, just humankind and in, in technological advancement. It is truly akin to the, the beginning of flight, um, the beginning of what we now call classic computing, uh, just understanding um, transistors and, and uh, binary arithmetic. <clears throat> this is the harnessing of quantum theory. Uh, and I love the quote of Richard Feynman of Caltech, who said, if you understand quantum theory, you don't understand quantum theory. Yes. It is, it's like magic, it's elusive, but it's amazing. And how might we harness that to, uh, to build the next generation of computers? Well, Colorado is truly in the forefront. We're in competition with other states, but uh, we have an amazing ecosystem for quantum computing, quantum sensing, quantum networking, and so on, all those applications, <coughs> excuse me, right here in Colorado. So in recognition of this resolution, uh, we've invited some of the, the industry professionals to come join us here, and I'd like to introduce them, and if, if y'all would stand when I call you out. <coughs> um, Dr. Phil McCoten of Vexlum. Uh, Dr. McCoten has uh, taught me mountains about the ecosystem of, uh, of quantum, quantum computing in particular. Uh, Max Perez of Inflection. Uh, Inflection is uh, one of Colorado's um, quantum computing, quantum computer development companies. Uh, Quantinuum, also a, uh, a development of quantum computers. If you all would stand, please, Chief uh, Engineer Dr. Steve Sanders, uh, Ryan Dubner, and Jim McLaughlin, uh, to whom I owe everything in my invol involvement with quantum and quantum compu computing. Um, George Sparks of Museum of Nature and Science is not able to be here with us, but we want to recognize him. Colonel Gary Dudley, graduate uh, from the United States Air Force Academy, 1968, and uh, has uh, built the bridge between the United States Air Force Academy and the quantum ecosystem, and his daughter, Debbie, is joining him today. From the University of Colorado, we got um, Scott Sternberg, who is the executive director of the Qubit Quantum Initiative Research and Innovation Office, and Missy Deal, the Director of Industry Relations, Relations from University of Colorado. Diane Samard from Slipglass, which is a visualization company visualizing the internal architecture of quantum computers and the whole quantum uh, theory in, in pictures. Corbin Tilleman Dick of Maybell Quantum. I'm gonna pause for a moment and talk about two of these companies that are not building uh, computers directly, but um, this gives you an idea of the ecosystem that's being created in quantum in Colorado. So one, one aspect, one uh, aspect of the computers that has to exist is cold, and really cold. And so Maybell, which is named after the coldest place in the state, as I recall uh, Corbin describing to me, um, they do refrigeration specifically for the cabinets that contain the chandelier of quantum computers, and it is incredibly cold right here in Denver. In fact, they're just moving into a new facility, and uh, when I first visited uh, Maybell, uh, Corbin told me that inside one of those cabinets was the coldest place on the entire earth. Pretty cool. Thank you for being here, Corbin. Um, Scott Rommel of Vescent. So, ions are directed inside these quantum computers uh, by a laser. I don't know how that works, but it works somehow. But if you can imagine um, manipulating um, elements that are that small, that tiny, then the precision has to be there. So a whole new generation of, of lasers is being created by Vescent right here in Golden, Colorado. And Vescent is creating these, these very precise, very clean lasers to direct the internal uh, positioning of ions with in, inside of a computer. So thank you, Scott Rommel of Vescent for being here. And I also want to uh, recognize Scott Davis, um, who, uh, who was his partner in, uh, in building Vescent. And uh, not in the room, but because they kind of can't be, is OEdit. But we want to recognize um, Xander Hanna, uh, Wendy Lee, all the folks from uh, the Office of Economic Development and International Trade, for all of their incredible support, uh, especially in, in getting the Semiconductor Chips Act here and, um, and, and all the other uh, grants that they're working with us uh, on bills that, that are gonna come through here in just a day or two. So anyway, 
I appreciate if you all would help me in welcome um, our guests from the quantum industry. Senator Bridges. Thank you, Mr. President. So during Aerospace Day, you recall, I did my best impression of a high school science teacher. I'm going to try that one more time here with quantum. So first of all, if you think about quantum, there were a lot of PhDs that were just introduced here. Uh, it's not just PhDs and kernels that are involved in quantum, because we're not just leading on the thought side here in Colorado. We're leading on the manufacturing side. And so that means jobs for folks across the economic spectrum and good paying jobs for the state of Colorado in the same way that aerospace has everything from those PhDs to those welders putting the actual devices that go into space together. We've got everything here in quantum from the Nobel Prize winners to the folks that are building these the, the coldest room in the entire world. So we have this, this full range of economic activity here in the state because of quantum. And when we say we're, we're on the precipice here, we're just at the start, and if you think about what the internet was in the 80s, no one could have imagined that you would be listening to music through a phone anywhere you want in the world, that you could order up a car anywhere uh, and ride anywhere you want to go. The, the technology that has been enabled by um, by semiconductors, no one could have predicted where that was going to go. Same for quantum. It's not just really accurate clocks. It is very accurate clocks, but it's not just really accurate clocks. The difference that this has already made in medicine research, the difference that this is going to make in everything, here's a, a weird example. We've got three different steps on the front of the Capitol here that all say one mile high. We've got one etched in stone, we've got the, the old USGS, we've got the new USGS, well, because these clocks are so accurate, with the right setup, we can actually figure out, based on gravity, exactly which one of those steps is absolutely, for sure, one mile high. We can get more accurate altitude measurements through the use of quantum. That's weird. No one was thinking, oh, quantum, I know what I can do with that, elevation. That is just one example of the breadth of influence that this industry is going to have on Colorado, on the world, on the way that we, the way we live. Um, if you can think about how different life is now than it was in the early 80s uh, because of technology, because of semiconductors, just imagine what quantum is going to be here in 40 years. I can't. These guys, maybe, maybe they can. Uh, at least they have a better idea of it than I do. But this is, this is a hub for it here in Colorado. We need to continue to invest to stay at the hub. This will be the Silicon Valley for quantum here in Colorado. And colleagues, thank you so much for your support of this resolution. And thank you all for what you're doing for our state, our economy, and for the future. Is there any further discussion? I did not go to quantum camp, just so everyone knows. <laughs> Members, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> However, I really liked the show Quantum Leap. <laughs> and I assume it's basically the same thing, right? That's pretty Similar. much what you guys do. Um, thank you, members. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, the motion is the adoption of Senate Joint Resolution 11. Are there any no votes? That's good. With a vote of 34 ayes, zero no, zero absent, one excused, Senate Joint Resolution 11 is passed. Senator Bridges. Thank you, Mr. President. I move the current roll call be added as co-sponsors. See no objection. The current roll call will be added as co-sponsors on Senate Joint Resolution 11. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. Majority Leader. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that Senate Resolution 004 be laid over to the end of the calendar. Motion is to lay over Senate Resolution 4 to the end of the calendar. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it, and that resolution will be laid over until the end of the calendar. Members, we will now uh, uh, go into a brief recess to greet all of our guests on the floor.
The Senate will come back to order. Mr. Majority Leader. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that we proceed out of order for a moment of personal privilege. The motion is for the Senate to proceed out of order for a moment of personal privilege. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no? no? The ayes have it, and the Senate will now proceed out of order. And will the clerk also add Senator Fields to the roll? S wait a minute. Who is that? Having voted on the prevailing side, <laughs> Senator Henriksen. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask for a moment of personal privilege. Granted. Thank you, Mr. President. As I, I think you've recognized and alluded to, um, I, I, uh, I follow, there's a, in, in, in huge footsteps that came before me and uh, in the shadow of giants. Maybe not literally, um, but the, uh, the reputation of the one and only representative Pueblo long precedes me, and that is, of course, uh, former Majority Leader Denea Escar, and I am proud to have her in the chamber with us today, along with the other members of the, Bo the Pueblo County Board of County Commissioners Zach Swearingen and Epi Griego, thank you for being here with us today. Third reading of bills. Final passage. Will the clerk? Please read the title to House Concurrent Resolution 1002. House Concurrent Resolution 1002 by Representatives Duran and Lynch and Senators Fields and Gardner. Submitting to the registered electors of the state of Colorado an amendment to the Colorado Constitution concerning creating an exception to the right to bail for cases of murder in the first degree when proof is evident or presumption is great. Senator Gardner. Thank you, Mr. President. I move House Concurrent Resolution 241002. To the resolution. Uh, thank you. Members, uh, recall from our discussion yesterday, this is the resolution that restores uh, first-degree murder as a non-bailable offense in Colorado when uh, proof is evident or presumption is great. Uh, it is very important. Um, as the president will instruct you when he calls for the vote, this requires a two-thirds vote. My hope is that this will be a unanimous vote of our Senate chamber because it is very important for public safety, for the rights of crime victims, for uh, justice generally uh, in the state of Colorado. Thank you. Senator Fields. Good morning, Mr. President and colleagues. I, too, agree with my uh, prime co-sponsor that we need to have a unanimous, a unanimous vote on this uh, resolution. The reason is really simple. And it's because when you commit first-degree murder, there needs to be circumstances that would be considered before you're eligible for bond. And since the Colorado State Constitution, Supreme Court came back and rendered that everyone's eligible for bond, even those who are, who have committed the most serious crimes as first degree murder. This is someone that may have killed 12 people, five people, six people, one person, it doesn't matter. But to have them be eligible for bond without further consideration is something is what this bill does. It ensures that we apply a balanced approach for those who commit first degree murder. This is a fix that the Colorado Supreme Court 
has asked us to do to be able to make sure that we have a balanced approach for those who have access to bail. So members, we urge you to vote yes or aye on this measure because it's important for victims, it's important for public safety, it's important for our well-being as a state. So please vote aye on this resolution, SR004. Is there any further discussion? See none, the motion before the body is the adoption of House Concurrent Resolution 1002. Are there any no votes? With a vote of 35 ayes, zero noes, zero absent, zero excused, House Concurrent Resolution 1002 is passed. Co-sponsors. Senators. Roberts. Mollica. Minority Leader Lundeen. Smallwood, Liston, Rich, Pelton B, Pelton R, Hanson, Baisley, Simpson, Will, Van Winkle, Gonzalez, Priola, Buckner, Michelson Janay, Cutter, Henriksen, Hawkes Lewis, Sullivan, Marchman, Bridges, Zenzinger, Janal, Danielson, Majority Leader Rodriguez, Colker, Coleman, Exum. Please add the President. Will the clerk please read the title to House Bill 1248. House Bill 1248 by Representatives Snyder and Soper and Senator Gardner concerning the Uniform Non-Testamentary Electronic Estate Planning Documents Act. Senator Gardner. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I move House Bill 1248 on uh, third reading and final passage. Is there any discussion? Uh, Senator Gardner. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, this is a bill. Um, a uniform law bill for uh, approving the use and implementing the use of non-testamentary electronic estate planning documents. Uh, I know that's exciting uh, for all of you, but uh, seriously, this is going to allow electronic, uh, uh, both electronic execution and storing of estate planning documents, non-testamentary. We already have uh, electronic wills as of last year. Um, this will be things like advanced directives, uh, trust documents, and the like, uh, bringing us into the 21st century. I ask for an I vote. See no further discussion. The motion before the body is the adoption of House Bill 1248. Are there any no votes? With a vote of 35 ayes, zero no, zero absent, zero excused, House Bill 1248 is passed. Co-sponsors. Senators Janal. Minority Leader Lundeen. Smallwood. Rich. Roberts. Gonzalez. Colker. Priola. General orders, second reading of bills. Senator Gonzalez. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. I move the Senate resolve itself into the Committee of the Whole for consideration of general orders, second reading of bills, and yeah. And yeah. You have heard the motion. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it, and the motion is adopted. The Senate will resolve itself into the Committee of the Whole for the consideration of the general orders, second reading of bills, and Senator Gonzalez will take the chair. Yes. 
And it's a strike below. Yeah. Got it. <coughs> there it goes. And that's the bill. I always forget. 1039. Buenos dias. The committee will come to order and the coat rule is relaxed. Uh, let's see. Mr. Hubler, will you please read the title to House Bill 1039. House Bill 1039 by Representatives Vigil and Titone and Senators Winter and Marchman concerning non-legal name changes for students in schools. Senator Marchman. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move HB 1039 and the Education Committee report. To the Education Committee report. Senator Marchman. Thank you, Madam Chair. In the Education Committee, we adopted a strike below amendment that we'll discuss um, maybe as a part of the bill, if that's okay. So it was a complete strike below. Is there any discussion in regards to the Education Committee report? Seeing none, the motion is the Pass adoption it. of the Education Committee report. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it, and that uh, committee report is adopted. To the bill, Senator Winner. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And this is a bill concerning educators and non-legal name changes for our youth. And the reason I'm on this bill is because I am one of the senators on the Colorado Youth Advisory Council. And what the Colorado Youth Advisory Council is, is there's a student representing every single one of your districts. And those students come together and they work throughout the summer and the fall and they propose language around bills based on their lived experiences and the experiences of their peers. And their priority bill that they brought to us was this bill because they see that trans kids or kids that aren't identified in ways that they want to be identified have a 77% higher rate of trying to commit suicide. And that means this bill will save lives because that rate goes down by 25% when they're affirmed by adults in their life and their correct name that they want to go by is used. Now, we're saying that's not always a legal name change, but it's going to save lives, it's going to reduce suicide. It came from our actual young people within our state that represent all of our districts, and they identified this as a priority in IRG yes vote. Senator Marchman. Thank you, Madam Chair. And to elaborate further on what my co-prime was saying, um, I shared this in committee, but want to share it here for everyone to understand that COYAC was created by a Republican legislator, Ellen Roberts, um, in 2008. So we're in our uh, 16th year as COYAC. The intention of the committee from its enacting legislation is to examine, evaluate, and discuss the issues, interests, and needs affecting Colorado youth now and in the future and to formally advise and make recommendations to elected officials regarding those issues. This is the only statutory way that youth access the legislature. So this year they introduced three bills. I'm the vice chair of COYAC, um, so I'm the chair, I'm, I'm the co-prime on all three of those bills. This is one. All three of the bills related to mental health. Um, this bill is fairly simple. The strike below, as I said, I uh, discuss, just defines gender identity and chosen name. It requires school staff use students' chosen names. It requires school districts to create a written policy. It adds intentional refusal to use a chosen name as a form of harassment and discrimination. It prohibits all waivers by State Board of Education and for all district and CSI charter schools. And it leaves the details of implementation to the local school districts uh, and the local charter school boards. So things like parental notification, parental consent, documents that are gonna have this chosen name on it. Those are all best at the local level and that's how this bill is um, crafted. 
So I'm a teacher, as you know that, and school staff to student relationships are really based on mutual respect, just like every relationship is. All people feel respected when they're called by their name. It's the most basic, the most fundamental, the starting point, square one, of relationship building in schools. Knowing, pronouncing, and spelling students' names correctly. Teachers are not bothered by having to keep tracks of, track of names. They're used to it. For years, even when I was in school, folks went by nicknames, and teachers kindly obliged. But now, when nicknames don't align with students' genders, some school staff don't feel like they're required to use students' chosen names. This is very damaging to students, and it leads to embarrassing experiences for these vulnerable children. Under current law, Colorado public school staff are required to use a student's chosen name and pronouns. This bill seeks to further clarify the use of chosen names. Who? Public school staff and students will be impacted. What? The students can ask to go by a chosen name, and school staff will refer to the student by their chosen name. Why? Because we're trying to set clear guidelines for students, parents, and school staff about chosen names. Where will this take place? At school and extracurricular activities. When? In writing in speech, during school, before, and after school. And how? Well, school staff are gonna follow the school district or charter school board policies when a student asks to go by a chosen name, including, but not limited to, looping in their counselors who work with the student. So the way this works in schools now, as I'm a current middle school teacher, is a student will share either privately or in front of classmates. I teach middle school, so they'll share all the things um, in front of people. Um, and I say, yeah, that's great. That's your new name. Great. Um, I update my subplan roster. I put maybe a different label on the kiddos class materials binder, and that's it. We don't have a class conversation. This is a personal matter, even if students bring it up in front of the class. So my next step would be to reach out to my teaching team. Who else teaches this kiddo? And inform them of the name change request. Generally then, the team lead would work with the counseling department to share this information. The school counselors work with students to understand the situation at home to begin the conversation with family when appropriate and safe. Currently, this, ex this uh, under existing law, this process goes on in many classrooms across Colorado. But the problem lies in two big bucket of issues. One is school districts. They are not enforcing current state law that requires school staff to address students by their chosen name if the student requests it. Most do. But frankly, we have some bad actors. So there are students sitting in Colorado seats in public schools right now. They have requested school staff to address them by their name, but school staff refuses to do it. And there is no enforcement by the school board of the current state law. So also, so teachers are not clear on what is required of them as public school employees. So we have some teachers who refuse to use any name other than the student's legal name if the chosen name does not match the student's gender at birth. And then we have teachers and school staff who just don't know what the process is. Do they contact the parents? Do they reach out to their counselors? Do they need to call the principal? What do you do? So do other teachers and school staff do this or is it just for them and for the student? So these school staff ask for guidance. But when districts don't have policies spelled out to honor a student by using their chosen name, their administrators can't help them. So this bill addresses both issues. Districts will provide written policies for how students change their chosen name. Staff will have clarity and a mandate to use students' chosen name when requested by following their district's or charter school's policy. We heard hours of testimony there were disrespectful people who recorded the hearing, mocking the policy, the sponsors, 
our committee, the advocates, and the children. I felt such sadness to witness such an attack on trans students and their parents. But we also heard from survivors of this vitriol. We heard from parents, students, and young, young adults, all who were able to confirm the fact that when you use a student's chosen name, they have a 25% less chance of taking their own life. That is a life, a life. Not respected, not accepted, not re even acknowledged in some cases, just alive. This bill is for every victim who's been outed or dead named in a Colorado school. This bill is affirmation from this body that we see you, we value you, we respect you, and we need you alive. The world's a better place with people honored in it. There is no reason or time for this level of hate. This bill is for every parent in Colorado who has watched their child show incredible courage as they figure out how they're gonna ask school staff to call them by their chosen name, only to have that request ignored. This policy is for parents like Kimberly Juno from Steamboat Springs, who came to share about the life of her son, Exton, and how it was saved by a few good staff members who honored Exton's chosen name. This bill is not about mutilation, physical, or social transition. Those issues are best handled by families in conjunction with counselors at schools often in a way that leads to a legal name or gender change. Colorado is a welcoming place. We honor those who are different than us, and we certainly honor the children who sit in our public schools by calling them by their chosen name and making sure each of them has a way to request and guarantee that they will be honored with the use of their chosen name. So folks have asked how this bill is going to be enforced. It's going to be enforced through the current discrimination process. And going into effect in July of this year, the new process under 22-1-143, that policy will allow students and their parents to report discrimination or harassment through a policy the district or charter school adopts. And um, around that language, um, I have an amendment to offer. There is an amendment at the desk. Mr. Hubler, will you please read L15 to 1039? L15, amend the Senator Education Marchman. Committee. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move L015. To the amendment. Thank you. Um, so this is a three-part amendment. What this does is it clarifies, it actually amends the committee report, but it clarifies the strike below that um, who is speaking is not a public school. I picture a building talking. It's not a public school. It's an employee, educator, or contractor. So we wanted to clarify that. That came up in committee. The second part of this amendment is that under the current discrimination and harassment process, the way to enforce that is through Title IX. So this will remain a viable way under the new harassment policy that goes in place next year and for the current harassment policy. Students will have an option, as well as parents, to report discrimination and harassment uh, with the, the current policy of the district or Title IX. The third part addresses the fact that you could just um, refuse to use a student's name by calling them student Marchman or student Winter or Ms. Winter or something like that. So that's what that addresses. With that, um, I would ask for your I vote on L015. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I also encourage a I vote on L015. Um, Making sure that this aligns with Title IX is really important because what Title IX is about is access to education. And we know when children's names are being misused or not identified, that that is limiting their access to education. That makes them want to not go to school, go to math class, go to science class, join reptile club. And so I'm asking for a yes vote on this amendment. Further discussion on L15 to 1039, Leader Lundin. 
Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, the amendment is the bill sponsors have uh, called out does three things. The first of the three things I agree with. Um, the, the strike below as written, the bill as we are considering it, has this unusual construction. Um, it, for the first time in the statute, first time in, in history as far as I know, the bill would direct a public school to address a student. It would, it would expect a public school to speak, something that we've never considered or required before, just it's an odd construction. Public schools issue diplomas, public schools convene uh, celebratory events, athletic events, et cetera. Public schools uh, provide academic ratings of how students are doing and so forth, but the public school actually has never spoken and as drafted prior to this amendment, the uh, bill would have required the public school to speak. And quite frankly, it would mandate the type of speech that the public school would be required to make. This cleans that up. It says that the employees, the educators, the contractors, and it specifically in this construction carves out and does not include volunteers. And so I want to put that into the legislative record. Volunteers are, would not be compelled under this um, act or under this bill as constructed um, with this particular amendment. So that is beneficial, I think, that first part. The, the second part, um, and, and we'll get into this more when we actually start to talk about the bill. The bill's not about uh, respecting individuals or using nicknames and things like that. Now this, the bill is about providing an enforcement mechanism that potentially ends the career of an individual who runs afoul of the expectations of the sponsors, the expectations of the bill. The second part of the amendment expands that level of enforcement. It provides not only the enforcement through the discrimination policies as put into place by the schools, but now under Title IX as well. And so that gives me uh, increased discomfort because I'm uncomfortable with the bill to start with. It is now expanding through this amendment, um, doubling down, if you will, on the enforcement mechanisms available. And so I don't particularly agree with that. To this third piece, um, it, it's interesting that there, there was potentially kind of a middle way forward where, where individuals, and quite frankly, I was referred to frequently and still am referred to frequently by my last name only. Um, I, I don't know whether it's, uh, it's a guy thing or what, but, but I am used to uh, spinning on my heel when somebody says Lundin. And, and so I do not perceive it to be disrespectful in any way when anyone uh, calls me out or calls to me or expects my attention um, by using only my last name, um, this amendment, this third part of this amendment, intrudes upon that and would make that potentially something that is a violation of harassment policies, a violation potentially of Title IX with the second element of this amendment. So at the end of the conversation, as I walk through the three elements of this, the first part of the amendment I, I kind of like, improves it, and as we work our way through this amendment, I find myself opposing the amendment because I believe it makes the bill, which I disagree with, even more onerous by virtue of adding this amendment. And I therefore urge your objection to and vote against Amendment 15. Further discussion on the amendment? Seeing none, the motion before the body is L15. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. no. The ayes have it. L15 is adopted. <laughs> to the bill, Senator Rich. Thank you, Madam Chair. There's a few things that I would like to talk about since they were mentioned uh, in the uh, sponsor's um, opening. I am a member of COYAC. This was my first year. And what I remember about COYAC when I was in the House was the then uh, former minority leader, the late Hugh McKean, and he talked about how proud he was of having uh, an interim committee like Koyak. But <clears throat> and, and in my own personal opinion, from what Koyak was then and what it is now, uh, it's changed drastically. When we were given these proposals by these children, um, it was interesting to me when I looked at the stakeholdering, 
that the stakeholder, and maybe this is how we're teaching them now in COYAC, was that all the stakeholdering was only done with like-minded advocacy groups and only legisl legislators from one side of the aisle. And I did hear that uh, there's 35 districts and they are all represented, but it's interesting, I'm a member of that committee and I wasn't ever given a copy of who those 35 are. So um, I'll have to take the sponsor's word for that. But what I'm uh, concerned about is that if, the, if COYAC is to help students understand the process and we're teaching them now that only do stakeholdering with people that agree with you, that's a problem, I think, that uh, we're not teaching them correctly. Maybe I'm old school. I always thought that when we work together, we do our best work. On this particular um, bill, at the time when it was a proposal, I voted no on it. I didn't feel it was the role of government to even get involved in this. Uh, that was one of the reasons. Um, when we were questioning the individual that drafted the proposal, I asked that person if that person had a problem saying it was fine to lie to parents. And without hesitation, it was, a, it was a quick yes, it's fine to lie to parents. Uh, that took me back, you know. I grew up in a family where I always respect, uh, respected my family, I always respected my parents. Uh, maybe, that's, maybe that's changed because <laughs> I'll tell you a story and it doesn't have anything to do with, but <clears throat> when I was in high school and I was a senior and a lot of people were playing hooky, and yes, you try to do that without your parents' knowledge. I never did that. Uh, I did it one time, but I asked my father's permission because I had enough respect for him to ask his permission without doing it behind his back. Um, I, uh, I'm, I'm concerned with this bill for a lot of reasons, and I Excuse do appreciate me. Senator the Senator Rich? Yes. It is actually kind of hard to hear you. Could you please move that other mic? There you All go. All right, we'll do it in Thank stereo. You. There you go. Okay. Oh, man, you're coming in in yeah, um, stereo. Go ahead. All right. Um, I really appreciate the strike below because the bill as originally written was, uh, was problematic in lots of ways because, but now I'm still having a problem with, uh, with what we have here because it's all about the schools or the kids getting to decide what their names will be and then forcing that on everyone. There is an amendment at the desk. Mr. Hubler, will you please read L14 to 1039? L14, amend the Education Committee report dated March 20th. Senator Rich. Thank you, Madam Chair. I am offering um, this amendment. Please move L the amendment. L014. Will you please move the amendment? I move L014. Thank you. Thank you. During the pandemic, Schools relied on parents and family members to fill the gap of remote teaching and learning, and they stepped up. Now parents are ostracized with this bill by allowing children to freely choose their name of the day without parents being notified. If parents are not at least notified in writing of, uh, by a school of their child's non-legal name change request, the General Assembly will be placing an additional burden on teachers and staff to mine their P's and Q's regarding student names so that they are not labeled and penalized for being discriminatory regarding a student's non-legal name preference, which has nothing to do with learning the future student's success. 
according to the American Academy of Pediatrics, gender identity develops in stages. Around age two, children become conscious of the physical differences between boys and girls. Before their third birthday, most children can easily label themselves as either a boy or a girl. By age four, most children have a stable sense of their gender identity. For many children, the most important role models are their parents and caregivers. Children look up to a variety of role models to help shape how they behave in school, relationships, or when making difficult decisions. Children also look up to their other relatives, teachers, coaches, and peers. That is all, that came from the American uh, Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry. By saying it takes a village to raise a child would imply that parents must be involved in their child's upbringing. Essentially, all stakeholders need to be on the same page throughout a child's education because social and learning environments now have vastly different and more stressful for youth, youth than one or two decades ago. By simply notifying parents of their child's request to be referred to a chosen name, educators help ensure the well-being of that student and their family. Now ask yourself, what would happen if a parent is not notified by the school of their child's name change request and finds out by another person? Let me give you a scenario. There's a young man named Kevin, and he has now requested to be named Kathy. And his friends are told they are now going to call him Kathy. One of his friends goes to his own mother and says, you know, my friend Kevin, now known as Kathy, wants to be called Kathy, and I'm told I have to call him Kathy. That parent, kind of confused by the whole thing, calls Kevin, now Kathy's mother, and asks her, why is your son now being called Kathy? That parent doesn't know anything about that. Now they call the school. The school, are they going to be honest with them, or are they going to lie about this? That is, that's a scenario that you should think about. And going forward, could parents hold schools and teachers legally accountable for failing to inform them of their child's name change requests? Could not notifying parents increase homeschool enrollment and further isolate students from the social interactions that children benefit when attending a public school? We all know that homeschooling is becoming more and more popular for just because of things like this. Wouldn't the notification sent to parents add a level of protection for teachers who are already under unbearable pressure to catch students up academically and socially post-pandemic? And school staff outweigh the confusion that could incur for families by not notifying the parents. A notification increases familiar awareness of a child's mental state and journey of self-discovery so they can be best supported at home in addition to their time spent in the classroom, especially if the parents volunteers in, in the child's classroom. That's, that's another thing. Wouldn't they be shocked to find out if they were volunteering in a class and found out that their child was going by a different name. Parents know their children best and can help reduce this added burden on teachers and school personnel, but only if kept in the loop. And for that, I ask for an I vote on L014. Senator Winter. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> and I'm here to ask for a no vote on L014. Um, I'm going to tell you about two different experiences in my life that I've had that I think show why L014 could be harmful. Um, so I am very glad that the good Senator 
from Mesa County respected her family and had the respect of her family. I wasn't so lucky. I did not have the respect of my family and I actually had abuse from my family growing up. And when I was in high school, I decided when I was announced prom princess to attend the prom with a friend of mine with an Asian background that I knew was not gonna be acceptable to my family. That, and what they would say would be awful. This is different than using a name, but I spent weeks worrying about how to talk to them about that and how to celebrate my senior year and how to celebrate being a prom princess. And that was just about going to a prom with someone from an Asian background. This isn't even my name. And so to have statements of parents know their children best, that doesn't mean that they're supportive. And we know that there is a 25% reduction in suicide attempts when adults in their life recognize them. And the good senator from Mesa County brought up that study from uh, the American Psychology Association that talked about how it does take a village. And it does take a village. So I have four children at this point, and I said this in committee, and one of the things we have in our house is called a crash couch. Anyone, anytime can come stay with us if they don't feel safe in their own home. And one of my children had a friend that was terrified to come out to his parents because they were conservative and religious and he didn't think that he was gonna be accepted. And my child told this child, if you're not accepted, you have a place to live, a place to sleep, you're gonna be warm, you're gonna be fed, and I'm here for you. And that child came out to their parents and was actually accepted. It was bumpy. It was hard. There was lots of tears. There were some fights. There was conversations. But the only reason he felt comfortable to talk to his parents was because I had a crash couch. So yes, it takes a village. And yes, I come from an abusive background where I couldn't even tell my people who my date was. And so to require parents to offer permission when we're trying to save these children by accepting them and providing that village of support, I ask for a no vote. Senator Baisley. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm uh, coming here to encourage support for um, L0, <coughs> pardon me, L014. Um, folks, this is, uh, School is not the place where we, we uh, send our kids for social engineering. Certainly there is a, a social aspect to, to school, but um, parents send their, their children to school in order to learn math and grammar, <clears throat> science and so on, uh, towards their being able to support themselves in career. Um, when other things happen, which of course they inevitably will, will, will happen in the social aspects, that's, that is not the purview of the school. And in, in this case, we've got the student being in charge of the teacher. Senator having... Baisley, I, I don't mean to interrupt, but we're on L014 and not the bill. So can you direct your comments to the amendment? As I am, because... When the student um, is, uh, is in charge of, the, of the, the teacher in directing what the, the uh, teacher must describe, how, how the teacher must uh, address them without the parent being involved in that, then, then the school system that the, that the parents has entrusted to teach them um, all the... Uh, 
the basics of professions and understanding, then this, this turns into um, a, the, the school system kind of taking advantage of the, the uh, students no longer being um, in the room, same room as the parent. This L014 is attempting to reestablish that, uh, that appropriate authority of the parent over the student, <clears throat> over their children. So that's why it's important that we uh, pass this bill, that we keep the parent in charge of their students, their children, rather than um, what the bill purports to do and that this amendment would fix where the, the bill purports to have the student in charge of the teacher and requiring uh, the name to be called at the risk of um, being charged with discrimination. So the parent needs to be involved. So it is, it's, it is so necessary that we keep the parent in their position of authority over raising that child. So I strongly recommend a, a yes vote on L014. Further discussion, Leader Lundeen. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, this amendment, Amendment 14, uh, is a good amendment. I support it, and it, I believe it goes to the heart of the, the core debate around this bill. Um, I have a couple of ob objections to the bill. The, the primary objection is the fact that it uh, absolutely chooses to um, intentionally break the communication and relationship between parent and child. And in some circumstances, I would argue in a very limited number of circumstances, but you've heard some compelling circumstances where that was not a beneficial, helpful relationship, um, and therefore I can see why the sponsors might approach it um, the way they have. But it is my sincere conviction that in not only the majority, but in a vast majority of the circumstances, the child-parent relationship is healthy, is beneficial. It is the best pathway for a child to walk through the discovery and understanding of who they are, no matter how they may perceive that, with the love and support of the people who know them best, their parents. This bill drives a wedge right into the middle of that relationship. This amendment would fix that. The amendment's simple. It says, upon a student's request to be addressed by a chosen name, the public school must notify the student's parents or legal guardian in writing and request permission to address the student by the student's requested chosen name. Okay, we're all trying to get to the same place here. If a student's parents or legal guardian gives the public school permission to address the student by the student's requested chosen name, Public school must address the student by the student's chosen name in the school and during extracurricular activities. Exactly the outcome the sponsors are looking for. A local education provider shall implement a written policy detailing how the local education provider will implement and comply with the requirements of subsections 2A and 2B, the two paragraphs I just read to you, of this section and may include a process for including a student's chosen name on the school records. That school records part is my second argument against the bill, which is the confusion, the consternation, the conflict that will be created within the administration of the actual school, among the various teachers, between teachers and administration, and within the processes of the school and school districts. But that's the secondary argument. The primary argument is the bill seeks to drive a wedge between parents and children which in the vast majority, I would say almost all circumstances, but not all, I acknowledge that, circumstances, absolutely the most beneficial relationship that exists. So we'll come back to the bill. I have a couple of amendments to try and address some of these issues myself, but I rise in strong support of Amendment 14 and say this makes clear the purpose and intent of the bill. If you want the parents to be engaged, accept Amendment 14. 
and let's find the best, most helpful pathway forward for all students. And let's honor the parent-child relationship, which is, in the vast majority of circumstances, fundamentally helpful. It's described in the literature across millennia as the building block of society. I urge your support of Amendment 14. Further discussion? Senator Fields. Good morning, uh, Madam Chair and uh, members. I stand in strong opposition to L014. The reason for me is really simple. I, I agree that parents are involved in the upbringing of their kids. Every single day, they provide them with shelter and food and whatever they need. And so oftentimes what happens when you're growing up in a home, your name might be legally William, but you're called Billy. And we don't have all these extra criteria in reference to having uh, the, the parents change the name because it's about liberty and respect to making sure that that child is, 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 is involved in a learning environment that celebrates who they are. So that William becomes Billy. And you know, there's all kinds of uh, different names. Jonathan might be Johnny. Anthony might be John. Elizabeth might be Beth. Isabel might be Bella. These are the names that parents give their children despite the legal name, because that's how they celebrate the growth and development of that child. I had a nickname. I'm not going to tell you what it is but I'll tell you privately. But it was not my legal name, but that was the name that my family gave me to celebrate who I am. It's, it's no, it, these parents know the given name or the name that, that their child has adopted or whatever. You all remember Roots. When they said, what's your boy name? What's your, what's your name, boy? He said, Kente Express. A Kente was his chosen name, his legal name from Africa. It was the slave master or whoever said that is no longer your name. Your name is Toby. I'm using an analogy right now. He wasn't identifying to be Toby. Stephen wasn't identified to be Stephen. He wanted to be Steve. Matthew didn't want to be named Matthew. He wanted to be known as Matt. And he didn't have to get a parent's permission because that's what the parents wanted to call him, Matt. Beth whatever it is. This is about celebrating the integrity and the value as it relates to how people want to be addressed. It's that simple. And parents know, parents know they call their kids what they do in the home place. 
And they take that name with them from preschool to elementary school to middle school to high school and on to professional employment and work. People modify their names every day. What is it? Kenneth, is it Keith? This is not extreme, this is not extraordinary. This is real simple logic to validating a young person in reference to how they want to be greeted and approached as they interact in our system, in our education system. It happens every day. Senator Fields, we are on L014. If you can speak to the amendment, please. We are on L014. If you can speak to the amendment, please. Yeah. So what the amendment does, it says that you have to get permission, permission from your parents to use a name that your family has already ordained you to have. Instead of Christopher, it's Chris. So members, this is just an unnecessary um, tactic to not address the current reality of what we're living in today. We need to catch up with the times. It's all right for William to be Billy. So vote no on this um, amendment. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Rich. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I couldn't agree more. It's all right for William to be named Billy. Because the parents called him Billy, the parents knew that he was Billy. Uh, my brother knew that he was Walter Jr., and a lot of people called him Jr., and that was fine. But the parents knew that. This is something else. You, you have, thank you for almost making our case there, that this is not about just a nickname. This is about getting permission to change your gender name to something that the parents know nothing about. Calling someone Chris instead of Christopher, that's something the parents already know. Calling Stephen and uh, Steve is something the parents already know. So that is not what this amendment is about. That is not what the bill is about. Please vote yes on L014. Additional discussion in regards to L14. Senator Gardner. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Well, L014 goes to kind of the heart of the bill. Um, L014 reminded me of a story. Now, let me tell you a story. When I was 10 years old, I entered the fifth grade. And my teacher was a grade school teacher like we don't have anymore. She was what was commonly known as a spinster school teacher. She actually never married. Her name was Miss Florence Thompson. And she was no nonsense. Um, uh, what I learned was um, grades one, one through four, we didn't have kindergarten when I grew up, probably why I had to struggle through law school the second time because I uh, didn't have kindergarten. Um, but it, it turns out that, at least in my life, the fifth grade was when you grew up. Uh, because on the first day, Miss Thompson called the roll and she came to my name and I was raised in a small town and everybody knew my family and we knew everybody else and she called Robert Gardner. And I almost didn't answer because I was talking to the person next to me. 
Um, and then she called it again and gave me a stern look, and I said, uh, Miss Thompson, uh, I, I'm Bobby. And she said, the role says Robert. That's the name your parents gave you, and that's what I shall call you. I uh, told my mother when she picked me up at school that afternoon, I said, Miss Thompson won't call me Bobby. And I was looking for support on this. And my, my mother made a parental decision, I guess. Uh, she said, well, you know, Miss Thompson is old school. And she's right. That's what, we, that's what we named you. I think you can probably, I think you can probably answer to Robert. And I did. Although on the playground, all my friends called me Bobby. And then, uh, then one time I got to be about 17 and I went away to a, a sort of a pre-college summer program and uh, we had a little mixer with, without alcohol. Uh, and I was uh, to introduce myself and I said, I'm Bob. So there we go. Um, what's the point of that with respect to L014? Well, you know, the bill creates the notion and the bill as, as amended by the committee report. Uh, I mean, the bill originally had the words preferred name and now we have chosen name. Uh, means any name that a student requests to be known as that differs from the student's legal name to reflect the student's gender identity. Um, you know, I looked at that and I, I thought, and this, reflect, this goes to the amendment and why the amendment's important. I thought, you know, in drafting that, um, no one, ever, no one ever raised a kid like me. No one ever raised a kid like my two. They're grown now, wonderful young people. Not so young anymore, actually, but. Um, why do I say that? Well, you know, I know this will come as a shock to all of you, but I've been a bit of a jailhouse lawyer most of my life. And if this was the law when I was a kid, when I got to be about 16, I tell you, I'd have a new name every week. Now you say, well, but this is a much more serious thing. Well, I get that. I do, I've thought about this a lot. Um, because we, on the one hand, are going to deal with and have to consider those teenagers, and all teenagers go through stuff, every last one of them. If you don't think so, you haven't raised one. And so with respect to the sponsors, I, I recognize that this issue of names may have a lot to do with gender identity and, and the, the difficulties and problems that cause, but that, that doesn't erase the, the issue that there's 25 other kids, some of whom are rebellious, maybe I should say all of whom, have some other issue going and are looking for a way to challenge the system. And, you know, if you told me that I, I could choose a name for gender identity, let me go out on a limb here a little bit. I would, I'd insist that I be called king one day. Maybe the next week of when I was thinking about becoming a lawyer, I'd want to be judge. 
Senator Gardner, can you get back to L14, please? Uh, thank yes, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Let me back up and explain to you why, what this has to do with Amendment L014. Thank you. L014 is about giving parents the ability to be notified. And my examples, Madam Chair, the way they relate to that was that I'm talking about all of the things that a teenager could think of to be called each week without the parents being notified. So that's the connection to L014. Thank you. Which relates back to the bill, which I have to talk about in order to talk about L014, because it's all part of a whole. Thank you. Now, what's the check on that? Because I recognize what the sponsors wish to do, and why, on the one hand, we have this very serious issue with respect to young people and gender identity, which may lead them to wish to be called by a different name. And a bunch of other kids who, once they know what the law is, and believe me, they, somebody will tell them what the law is. Um, I, I read the newspaper when I was 14. Um, I know that'll come as a shock to you as well, but boy, if I saw this, I'd you know, I had, a, I, I had one teacher that I, uh, that I loved, and I had one teacher that I, I didn't, and the one I didn't, I, I looked for legal, legal ways, by the way, that no one could challenge me. What's the check on that? What's the check on Robert, Bob, Bobby, all of which were fine? and all of which, by the way, someone calls me now. What was a check on me just gaming the system every week? Or, more importantly, to avoid what some might characterize as trivial, but I would characterize as young people finding their identity, what's the check on that? Parents. Parents. Because I can tell you what my, my father and mother would have said if this was the law and I was doing that. They would have started, they would have started uh, reasonably and said, you know, while you're worrying about that, Bob, I noticed that your, your grades and... Uh, whatever, or not as good as they should, so maybe you ought to concentrate on that. Um, two, you know, you might not want to build a uh, reputation for being obstreperous, of which, to which I would have responded obstreperously, oh no, maybe I do. <laughs> but at some point, my parents would have said, you're not going to do that. But on the other hand, maybe I was, and by the way, just so you know that I am not uh, unknowledgeable of these issues and these choices. Um, when I was an Air Force uh, judge advocate and attorney, I, I served as a defense counsel uh, because they were looking for people who were willing to take on the system to be defense counsel. And uh, I, I, in my period of time, because we represented young uh, military members, we, we had some young people, and I represented some with gender identity issues, and it was very difficult and very heartrending. So these can be serious things, but where do you look for the best interest of that person, of that young person who is 14, 15, 16? Parents. Now, you know, this bill is a, 
in the larger sense is the public policy, and every public policy makes a choice. And public policy choices are not ideal, and they're not perfect. And so do I recognize that there may be parents that are not going to do what is best for a child? I don't know. There, if there's any parent in this room that looks back on what they did and said, everything I did was right for my child, that was the right decision, you're just not being honest with yourself. And, and even better, you should, you should become a grandparent so your parents can, uh, your children can come to you and go, you know, that was harder than it looked, but what, what do I say to my children? Think about it, pray about it, do what's best for your child and love them, love them. And even if you do it wrong sometimes, if you love them, that will be what matters. Look, if you go back to the core bill without this amendment, what you have is a well-intentioned policy to deal with the question of what will a child be called at school based on gender identity. And, it, and by the way, it's only about gender identity. It's not about whether you'll be called Robert, Bob, or Bobby. It's only about gender identity. which is interesting to me because I think that works much mischief as well. But there's no, there's no notice to the parents. There's no consultation with the parents. There's no acknowledgement that until the moment you hit 18, You're a child, pretty big one as I recall, but nevertheless, a child. And parents have to adjust to when you get to be 16 and 17, the decisions you make and how you account for them and what you can, what you can practically tell a teenager and what you practically can't tell them. But there is nowhere in this bill absent L014 where parents are involved at all. I have questions without L014, just to make clear I'm talking to the amendment. I have questions about whether the bill is constitutional. I mean, really. But Senator Gardner, right now we're on L014. Uh, I, Madam Chair, I am talking about how without the enactment of L014, the bill may well be unconstitutional. That's why I'm talking about this issue of constitutionality of the bill, because L014, in my mind, clears up that very serious issue. I'm always on the amendment, if that's what we're on, Madam Chair, because the amendment goes to that question. The amendment goes to that question. Does a parent have a right to say to a governmental entity what their child will be called. Now, it's, it's, it's interesting. This starts to come up. I mean, do you have a legal right to say what your child's going to be called? 
Turns out you do. There's a moment in time. It happens in the hospital. I don't know. Maybe it didn't happen that way anymore, but when my children were born, it happens in the hospital, and a nurse comes in and, uh, and, and says to mom, and, uh, and hopefully dad's there, what are we naming this baby? They don't go and ask everybody else. And, you know, there have been all sorts of cases. This is, Madam Chair, before you say anything, this is about parental rights with respect to the naming of children, which is L014. The, the thing has been, you know, there are, there are absurd cases, but it, it shows um, of wanting to name your kid a number or a symbol or something else, and, and there's fights with the state. The only reason I get into this, Madam Chair, with respect to L014 is because it turns out that there are very serious legal constitutional questions about naming of children and, and what that one does. Um, members, you know, I have a lot of problems with the bill. And when L14 was offered, I said, you know, that's really on one page what my issue has been about this. That's what it's about. You know, I, I don't know what, it, what would have happened if uh, my, my mother had gone in and told Miss Florence Thompson, well, we named him Robert at birth, and, uh, but he, he wants to be called Bobby, and I want you to call him Bobby. I don't know. Uh, she was pretty much on parents having a right, but I'm not sure my mother would have won that one, but my mother didn't want to take it on anyway. Uh, look, members. We have policy after policy where we have stepped in between parents and children, where we, the state, have said we know better. Well, it ain't perfect no matter who says so. And the state's going to get it wrong some. And children, children are going to get it wrong some. And parents are going to get it wrong some. But who is likely to get it wrong least? Parents. Parents. L014 puts parents into the equation. It means that parents will know and parents will have to deal with that. Parents who, by all natural law, love their children. will have to find out why does my child want to be taught, addressed by a different gender? What are they dealing with? Members, there, there are a host of reasons from the creating a situation where, where there's, there's all sorts of game playing to this to the very serious, serious thing of if that's the case, shouldn't a parent know? And shouldn't a parent be able to evaluate what is, why is my child asking to be called a name of a different gender. This is about doing the right thing with respect to parents and children. And I do, I, I think there's a serious legal question here uh, of interposing the state between parent and child that this creates. 
I ask for an I vote on L014 to avoid all of that and to give all of us comfort that this would be the right thing to do with this amendment. Seeing no further discussion, the motion before the body is the adoption of L014. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. no. The noes have it, and L014 is lost. To the bill, Leader Lundin. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Back to the bill, House Bill 1039, um, and the strike below that is now the bill, um, as amended by the committee report. Um, I, on the, the prior amendment, Amendment 14, we discussed what I would describe as my primary objection to the bill. Um, I alluded to the fact that my secondary objection to the bill is it's going to create conflict. It will create conflict within the schools, among the, the school leadership and their, their teachers, et cetera. But it also creates conflict between the statute as amended by House Bill 1039 and the existing laws of Colorado and the federal laws of the United States of America. So we have ways of addressing this. Um, this particular amendment is an amendment that seeks to align some of the challenges in a way that won't create so much conflict. And quite frankly, without this amendment, maybe even with this amendment, I would argue, it is very likely that we will lose federal funding. Federal dollars do pour into the K-12 education apparatus, and that money, although not as big as what the local property taxes pay for or the general funds of the people of Colorado, the state of Colorado, and the taxes the people pay for, the federal money still is significant. And there is a risk with this bill as drafted, and we're offering an amendment to try to thread the needle. Don't know if it's going to do it or not, but try to thread the needle on the question of the loss of federal funds. There is an amendment at the desk. Mr. Hubler, will you please read L017 to 1039? L17, Amend Education Committee Report, dated March 25, 2024, page 2, line 12, after records. Insert a written policy. Senator Lundin. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I move amendment L017 to House Bill 1039. Um, to the amendment. Thank you. So what this amendment would do is if you go to the re-engrossed bill, which is the bill as it would appear after the committee report has been made, I believe, if I'm doing this correctly, go to page three and you, you look into the, uh, the, the language here. It says the school's written policy, this is all about establishing a written policy that the schools must uh, enforce of this section. It must specify that uh, knowing or intentional use of a name other than a student's chosen name is discriminatory. Then it would go on with this amendment, say, the written policy adopted pursuant to this section, um, subsection five, must comply with the Federal Family Education Rights and Privacy Act of 1974. This is an act commonly referred to as FERPA, and it um, addresses parents' rights um, within, it addresses an enormous array of things, but one of the things it touches against is parents' rights within the federal law. Um, the federal law, that it refers to here, which is 20 U.S.C. section 1232, as amended, says no funds shall be made available under any applicable program to any education agency or institution which has a policy of denying or which effectively prevents the parents of students who are or have been in attendance at a school of such agency or such institution, referring back to the schools, as the case may be, the right to inspect and review the education records of their children. The law, the federal law goes on, if any material or document in the education record of a student conflicts, I believe it's going to, or includes information on, on one or more other students, other than the student in question, the parents of such students shall have the right to inspect and review only such part of such material or document as it relates to. So I, I can't see uh, my, my neighbor's child's records and my neighbor can't see my child's records, but I can see my child's records. Uh, shall have the right to inspect and review only such part or material or document as relates to such student or to be informed of the specific information contained in such part of such material. Each educational agency or institution shall, shall establish appropriate procedures for the granting of a request by parents for access to the education records. So this is knowledge of what the school is doing with regard to the student, the child, um, 
their children within a reasonable period of time. Reasonable period of time, it says, and then it goes on to say, but in no case more than 45 days after the request has been made. So federal government already has in place law that says you can't hide the ball between a parent and their child. You've got to make visible and available. Then this amendment goes on to, to refer to the Colorado statute um, because there is a potential conflict between this bill and the Colorado statutes. And there goes some wonderful school children who are listening to us debate a bill that will change the policies potentially of their schools. Thanks for stopping by. Leader Lundeen. Yes, would I, I'm not, I guess I didn't, I didn't announce them. So I'm, it's not findable. I just waved at wonderful citizens, soon to be citizens. Um, I, I will continue to speak Leader to Lundin. my amendment 17, Madam Thank, Chair. Thank, thank you very you. much. So the, um, the amendment then also goes on to refer to uh, compliance with section 22123, um, which addresses some of these same things with regard to parents' rights. And let me find that here. The, the letters on the page continue to get smaller every year. I need to talk to the folks in the print shop. I don't know what the deal is that they seem to be getting smaller every year. Um, 22.1.1.2.3, protection of, a st of student data, parental or legal guardian consent for surveys. As used in this section, education records and the directory information shall have the same meaning as those terms are as defined in the Federal, uh, uh, federal Family Education Rights and Privacy Act, we just referred to that FERPA, as amended in the uh, statutes again as um, we, we previously referred to, referred to. And education records shall include an individualized education program. So this has to do with, and this is part of where there's potential conflicts that we've got to be careful about. The student has an IEP, that's a separate document that's governed by federal laws as well as state laws, and we need to make sure that if we're changing names, we get all the name changes lined up properly. And that's critically important. And it also is critically important, I would argue, that the parents be aware. So, Amendment 17, and I'll, I could go on further deep into the Colorado statute, to call out the, the potential conflict and the potential challenge that we have, and we must figure out a way to thread the needle, and I'm not even certain with this amendment that we'll be able to do that, but this amendment, I think, enhances our chances of threading the needle, getting it right, and reduces the risk, even though I think there will remain a risk should this bill advance, of losing federal dollars. So I urge your support of Amendment 17. Leader Lundeen, I was trying to listen to you, but I'm about to reinstate the coat rule because Senator Pelton B's shirt is so loud that I couldn't hear you. Back to Amendment L-17. I'm gonna to try to listen hard. <laughs> Senator Winter. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, we view L-17 as a friendly amendment. We certainly want to align with current federal law and Colorado law, um, and we still think the intent of the bill can be met while we're saying we are concurring with current law, and we encourage a yes vote. Seeing any further discussion? Thank you. Uh, Seeing none, the motion before the body is the adoption of L-17-2-1039. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. The ayes have it. L-17 is adopted. <laughs> Seeing no further discussion, Leader Lundin. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. There's an amendment at the desk. Thank you, Madam Mr. Chair. Mr. Hubler, will you please read L-18 to 1039? L-18, amend the Education Committee report dated March 25, 2024, page 2, line 12. Leader Lundin. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, I appreciate very deeply the sponsors taking the prior amendment. I think that improves the chances of threading the needle. Quite frankly, I believe it also opens the door to actually letting parents know what's going on, and that's critically important. Um, doesn't resolve my matters with the bill, does not convert me from a no vote to a yes vote, but I think it is, in fact, part of the development of better policy. Amendment 18 is slightly different. This is one where we still have another potential conflict. Did I move it? I move Amendment uh, 18, L018 to 1039. To the amendment. Um, we still have a potential conflict. 
Schools have the right to establish a dress code. Now, everybody has a different perspective on dress codes at schools. Some people think it's one of the reasons why those schools are successful. They actually have the discipline of dress, and therefore they have the discipline of mind to actually make educational and learning attainment. That's critically important in the minds of some people. Other people think dress codes hamper individualism, et cetera. But the reality is it doesn't matter what you think about that. The statute in section 2232.109.1 says schools have a right to establish dress codes. This particular amendment says you must, on behalf of this bill, should this bill advance, 1039, allow for an acknowledgment that the state of the Colorado law already provides for the flexibility of a school to have a dress code. You must acknowledge that within this bill. I urge your support of amendment L018. Uh, let's see, Senator Winter. Uh, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, this amendment is about dress codes which can be related to gender, or can be related to culture, or can be related to sports. Um, but this, is, this amendment is being brought in a bill that's simply about names, and I would request that the chair offer a title ruling. A request for a title ruling has been made. We will stand in the senatorial five. Should just put it on We are back in our consideration of L018. The um, sponsors have requested a title ruling, and upon further review and inspection, I rule that L018 falls outside of the title of House Bill 1039. Leader Lundeen. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. You know, early on in the session when we're starting to draft bills and we don't quite yet know what the title of the bill is going to be, um, I once upon a time tried to submit a title, um, and Julie Pellegrin, who is, I, I think, one of the most able drafters ever to grace the halls of this hallowed institution, said, no, Senator Lundeen, concerning a Colorado law is not an acceptable title. It's a little too broad. I wish this title were a little broader so I could have gotten my amendment onto the conversation. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Leader Lundeen. Seeing no further, dis is there any further discussion? Senator Rich. I'm going to do this in stereo, Madam there you Chair. Go. Thank you. Appreciate that. <clears throat> well, there is an amendment at the desk. Mr. Hubler, will you please read L16 to 1039? L16, amend Education Committee. Senator Rich. March. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. I move L16 to HB 1039. To the amendment. Thank you, Madam Chair. Well, earlier we talked about uh, a previous um, amendment, L14. Uh, this one is very similar. Uh, as I expressed uh, before, if parents are not at least notified in writing by a school of their child's non-legal name change, the General Assembly will be placing an additional burden on teachers and staff. This bill is for them to still provide notification but not seek permission. It's important that we protect the educators and students uh, from lawsuits, uh, from uh, this costing them more money. Uh, I don't think there's any harm in notifying the parents. As I said before, they are the ones that raise these children. They are the ones that love these children. And they are the ones that take care of them. So I ask for an I vote on L016. Senator Marchman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and thank you to the good Senator from um, Mesa County, I'm sorry, Grand Junction uh, for the amendment. Um, so what this amendment would do would require parental notification before a chosen name is used in the school. And um, this is a problematic um, amendment for us. I would ask for a no vote on L016. I'd like to explain a little bit further why. Um, the bill as drafted has a requirement that a chosen name is only to be used upon a student's request. And if a student um, requests to, in, in the situation, if school personnel knowingly use a name other than the student's chosen name with the parent, um, that is problematic under this. It also, we've reached out to all of the folks, school districts and such. This amendment, if accepted, would put CASE, the Colorado Association of School Executives, opposed. So um, I ask for your no vote on L016. Senator Liston. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, well, members, um, I rise in support of Amendment L016. You know, it's, it's only reasonable that, uh, for the parents to be notified if, uh, in, in anything else, if their, if their child is, is going to play in a sport, uh, they, they have to be notified. If their child is going to get a driver's license, uh, more often than not, a young, that they, that they get some sort of uh, parental okay. If their child is going to get uh, uh, medical care, their child is, uh, the parents are going to be notified. Uh, all kinds of, of uh, things for, for notification. You know, it, it, it just seems to me that um, as this bill moves along, what it's going to do is undermine uh, people's confidence in our public school system. That, uh, that is going to be the unintended consequence of legislation like this. I can foresee the, uh, the uh, day which will come if this legislation is allowed to pass in its current form that there will be a further erosion and exodus um, from our public schools. Uh, right now, uh, private, uh, I can see uh, private schools and certainly the homeschool movement growing by leaps and bounds if, uh, if this uh, bill goes on. So really- Senator uh, Liston, just, we're on L16. I know we are, Madam Chair. So uh, once again, back to the notification, <clears throat> excuse me. I think it's entirely reasonable that the parents should be notified uh, if, if their uh, child is going to school and coming back with different names and so forth. I, as a parent, I would want to know that. And I think um, as I speak to my, uh, to my friends and others that I know, I'm, I'm very confident that they too would want to know uh, if their child's name is, is uh, you know, coming up with some 
other uh, type of uh, name. So this is entirely reasonable, and uh, I would urge an L vote, an I vote on Amendment L016. Senator Rich. Thank you, Madam Chair. So um, I know that uh, they said Case would be in opposition if L016 passed, but there are school boards that support this. Uh, my school board, for instance, in District 51, supports this. So uh, you might say that an association will oppose, but you haven't talked to all 178 schools. So I don't know, but maybe you're making my point here by not wanting to include L016 and keeping parents out of the loop of what children are deciding is best for them. Uh, and what we have here is legislating deceit, and I think that's a real shame if you don't support Senator L016. Rich, I'm just going to remind all of the members in our chamber that we're going to treat each other with dignity and respect and decorum and not impugn any motives. Grateful for the conversation, Senator Winter. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm urging a no vote on L016. Um, we intentionally left a great deal of local control within this bill. And if an individual school district does want to set this policy, they're allowed to. But for districts that don't want to, or parents in districts that don't want to, we don't want to force them to. And so I urge a no vote on this amendment. Seeing no further discussion on L016, uh, the motion before the body is the adoption of L016. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. No. The noes have it. L016 is lost. <laughs> Senator Van Winkle. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I do know two attempts have been made uh, regarding parental notification. And those uh, were much longer, more um, substantive changes to the bill. Uh, I do have an amendment here. And so. I will put it on the desk. There is an amendment at the desk. Mr. Hubler, will you please read uh, L20? L20, Senator Van education. Winkle. Thank you, Madam Chair. And what this amendment does, well, it's move very the simple. Amendment, please. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. I move L020. To the amendment, Senator Van Winkle. Thank you, Madam Chair. Appreciate your guidance. Uh, what this amendment does is very simple. It does not delete anything from the bill. It doesn't change anything in the bill. It simply adds this one sentence, and that one sentence is, upon a student's request to be addressed by a chosen name, the public school must notify the student's parents or legal guardian. That is the entirety of the amendment. It doesn't even say exactly how that notification uh, must be done. It doesn't say it needs to be an email. It doesn't say it needs to be written. Uh, it just says that the school must notify the parents or legal guardian. Uh, this is very important for various reasons, especially if a, a young person is going through substantial changes in their life um, and trying to make decisions about the future of their life. The parents, uh, of course, need to be involved, um, or at least simply, uh, maybe not even involved, but at least simply notified of that change. And so I ask for a yes vote on this very uh, simple, small amendment. Senator Marchman. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I urge a no vote on L020. Uh, members, this would have the exact same impact as L016, which is what we just, um, which just failed. So I would urge a no vote on L020. Further discussion? Senator Van Winkle. Thank you, Madam Chair. Well, the exact impact that this amendment would have is that the parents would be notified that their child, uh, due to a new identity, would be going by the name of that new identity. So the only impact that would have is that the student at that school would notify the parents or legal guardian, uh, perhaps at a parent-teacher conference, perhaps uh, by an email, or perhaps when they pick up their child uh, from their elementary or middle school or high school. 
Uh, I ask for a yes vote. The only impact this would have is that parents would know what is going on in their child's life uh, during the school hours. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, the motion before the body is the adoption of L20 to 1039. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. No. The noes have it. L20 is lost. <laughs> to the bill, Senator Hawkins Lewis. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to commend the sponsors uh, for listening to the students who served on our Colorado Youth Advisory Council. This is historic. We have students who are now engaged in our legislative process. They have brought bills forward, and it is very, there's very clear reasons why they have asked for this bill and why we should adopt it. I worked on a bill last year with the illustrious senator from Loveland about getting school therapists uh, into the schools because we have such a dire need of helping students. And one of the a student teacher, one of the teachers who testified from Boulder Valley School District gave us very dramatic stories as to why we should pass a bill like this. What she said was, I hope it's okay, Ms. Smith, I'm gonna mention you because your testimony was incredible. She's been a teacher, special ed and regular teacher for 23 years. In those 23 years, she attended 20, 20 funerals. And those funerals were from suicides of students that she knew. Of those students, the majority of those students were dealing with either trying to come out, trying to talk about who they are, trying to deal with gender identity, trying to make it in this world where they don't feel like they fit in. This bill gives those students a chance to be who they are. As co-chair of the LGBTQ caucus, there is not a week that goes by that we do not hear from trans youth who are desperate, desperate to love who they wanna love and be who they wanna be. 45%, 45% of our LGBTQ youth say they have considered suicide. The ability to use the name that they want to use is just one piece of helping them cope in a society where they feel that they are not supported. I want to also tell you the story about one of my former constituents when I was the representative over in Louisville. Her name was Alana Chen, 24-year-old. Her entire time in high school, she couldn't talk to anyone. She couldn't talk to any of her parents. She couldn't talk to her parents. She, she couldn't talk with anyone that she trusted. And on December 7th of 2019, they found Alana's Chen, Chen's body near Gross Reservoir in Netherland. She did that because she felt like she couldn't be who she wanted to be. She couldn't she didn't have anyone to speak with. Bills, laws like this can change lives. We must do more to listen, to listen to our youth. And the way to listen to them is to say their name and let them say the name that they would like to use. Colleagues, this is 
an easy, respectful, humane piece of legislation that we can do in Colorado to allow students to be respected and to be treated with the dignity that they deserve. I'm asking for an I vote on this bill. Further discussion? Senator Baisley. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I serve on the, uh, the Senate Education Committee and I was rather taken aback that we had that bill brought before us for a couple of reasons. Um, one is that our, our schools are not doing so great. If we look at the, the percentages of people who are, are operating at grade level, in all the basics, it's not something that we ought to be proud of. We need to improve on that, and that's what I believe that we ought to be um, considering in the Senate Education Committee. We ought to be finding ways to, to improve the effectiveness of our education um, system. <clears throat> this seemed more, this bill seemed like an inappropriate bill for the Education Committee. I know it had to do with, uh, with uh, requiring teacher behavior, but it was much more of a social program, which I think is inappropriate for for uh, what we're trying to accomplish. In fact, I think if we could focus on, uh, on doing extremely well with our education system, then these social matters would become less of an issue as uh, students are focusing not on their social life within the, the school as much as their academic life. And second, uh, this was brought as uh, an idea from, from COYAC, and I would, I would suggest that we need to coach the COYAC folks that <clears throat> if they're going to bring something to us for consideration that this is a matter of state law that we're talking about, putting into law the force of government for something. Um, <clears throat> we all have our deep concerns, and appropriately so, about their mental health, <coughs> excuse me, about mental health and about the suicides, but there are two sides to that story. As as the testimony brought with subject matter experts, folks with doctorates in the topic that came and, and gave witness that said that if we do opposite of what was being suggested that we would save more lives. So this is not a matter that we have the expertise and even the wisdom, I don't believe, on, this, on the uh, education committee to make these social engineering decisions. And so for that reason, I think that this is not an appropriate bill for us to be voting on, and so I would uh, strongly recommend a no vote on, uh, on this bill. Thank you. Senator Cutter. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I wanna say, firstly, that I am here for Kai, and I appreciate all the remarks I've heard so far. I truly believe with all my heart that people that we need to take into consideration the whole person, all of the aspects, and when kids feel accepted and loved and, and appreciated, they're going to do better in school. Being hungry, being, um, having mental stress and uncertainty in your life, that all impacts the way kids show up at school. So it, I, I would argue that this bill is going to help kids' performance at school. I came here for youth. Um, and I have a deep trust for young people and them knowing what they need in their life. Of course, parental guidance and involvement is important, but I also think we need to listen when kids tell us what they need. And I appreciate so much um, that Koyak presented this bill and have um, championed this. They've asked for it, and they've asked for us to respect them in this way. Names are deeply personal and meaningful to people. And kids are experiencing increased learning difficulties and struggles with mental health, all kinds of things that are going on in kids' life right now. And we ask a lot of them, social media, all kinds of pressures. We ask so much of them. This should not be that difficult. Teachers can keep track of who, can eat who can't eat peanuts. So an honest attempt to respect a student's uh, request shouldn't be that difficult. If a parent doesn't know this um, 
basic fact about their child, then there's really more things to be worried about. 52% of trans youth experience suicidal ideation. If trans and, and non-binary kids are accepted in at least one place, home or school, then suicide ideation drops significantly. I wish that every child felt accepted and loved in their home, but they don't. There's nothing that we can do in the immediate future to change that fact. That's just a fact. This is an easy way to help ease the pain for kids who are already dealing with a lot, and I am very proud to be able to support this bill. Senator Kirkmeyer, followed by Senator Hendrickson. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I'm just going to tell you a story about my own daughter. Um, she was in seventh grade. She wanted to change her name. She wanted to change her name from Katie to KT. So from K-A-T-I-E -E to K-A-T-E-E. -E. Not a really big deal. But before she could do that, the school called me and asked if it was OK. And here's why it's important that parents are notified. The parents are given the heads up that their child wants to change their name or that they're struggling with something. And I'm not going to say my daughter was struggling with anything that I would have thought was a big deal, but for her it was because there were like six other girls in her class that were named Katie. And she just wanted to be a little bit different. I didn't know that because she didn't come and talk to me at first because she just decided that day that she wanted to change her name. And so the, the school notifies me and I get to have a conversation with my daughter about something that she hadn't really made me aware of, you know, and just said, look, I just want to be a little bit different. And it's like, that's cool. But then it also led to even further conversations and, and I have a good relationship with my daughter. So, you know, it even led to further conversations about what's going on in her class, what's going on with her, like what she's talking about. And that was, that's healthy. That is healthy. Yeah. We're talking about something a little bit bigger here, but what I heard is we, people should be commended for listening to children. But denying a parent's ability to listen to their child, we shouldn't be commended for that. For a parent to basically be summarily just dismissed from their child's life, that's not right. That's not healthy. Parents, times, we're all busy. Everybody's busy. Parents get busy. And you know what? And then to say that the school isn't even going to notify them about probably what could be maybe a minor, a major decision in their child's life, and say we're just gonna keep the parents in the dark? We're not gonna let you know that your child's having some struggles, they wanna change their name? We're not gonna notice you? Notice you, that's all we asked for. That's all those amendments we're asking for. Just send a notice to the parents. So give them a heads up. Let them know something's going on in their child's life that maybe they missed. Maybe open up those conversations. And I think we all know that not every family life is all that great, but the majority are. And we talk about suicide here, that if they don't get to change their name, you know, and, and mental, mental health of the child, by not encouraging the parent's ability to know what's going on in their child's lives, it's a deception. You're introducing deception, more deception. You may be exasperating the problem. All the school had to do, all they have to do is just notify the parent. And say the kid had to call them. Just give the parent a heads up. Your child's having some pretty major issues, maybe. And as a parent, I'm telling you, as a parent, as a grandparent, heck, I'd want to know that. Because sometimes, again, in our busy lives, you might have missed something. You might have missed your daughter saying, you know, there are five kids named Katie in my class. And every time they say Katie, we're all like, what? You know, kind of thing. And 
She just wanted to be a little bit different. That's okay. But what's not okay is I didn't have that opportunity to find out from her. Under this bill, I would not have known. I would have not have known. God, I need to like kind of maybe listen a little bit more to my kid. Even though she did mention that maybe in the car when I was taking her to school. You know, I missed it because I was thinking about all the things I had to do that day. So what this bill says, we're not going to notify parents. We asked. We asked to have the parents notified. That's not a big ask. We're going to deny parents the ability to know what's going on in their child's life and then listen to them. And what we're going to do is just maybe further exasperate the issue. And let me just remind you, these children that we're all talking about, they are not our children. They're not your child. They might be my child. They might be someone else's child. But they're not your child. I don't think you should have the right to tell me, as a parent, about my child, that I don't get to know what's going on in my child's life, that you're going to encourage deception. What do you think that does? How about an unhealthy family? How about how you are maybe making a family relationship further strained or bringing in a problem into that family? How do you think it would feel for that parent, for that mom, me, to think that it, the school thinks it's okay to deny me my ability to hear from my child, to deny me the ability to listen to my child, to deny me the ability to talk to my child and communicate with her and find out what's going on, to maybe prevent that suicide? You know, you. You think that denying a parent the ability to hear from their child, to know what's going on in their child's life, is going to prevent suicides? Maybe this is just the beginning of that mental health problem, and all you're doing is exasperating it. You're making it worse, because now the family, her parents, they don't even know. They can't even say hey to the grandparents. You know, she's struggling here. She's having some difficulty here. And we all need to be paying attention more, maybe, to this child. But by the school not notifying the parent, they don't even know. They don't even know that their child is struggling. They don't even know. Aren't we all supposed to be watching out for this kid? But this is not, this bill doesn't push that. This bill doesn't say we're all going to look out for this child. It says we're going to deceive the parents. We're going to keep it from you. We're not going to notify you. Your child's having some maybe difficult times, some challenging times in her classroom. And it may be as simple as there's just five more kids with the same name, or it may be a lot more worse than that, that this child is truly struggling with their identity. But gosh, why let the parent know? How does that make sense to anyone who has children? Why let the parent know? Why let the family know? So that maybe they can wrap their arms around this child and really help them deal with this struggle. Maybe make sure they get those resources. Essentially, you're assisting in removing parents from their children's lives. That's, to me, what this bill does. It's trying to remove the parents from their lives. I think that would be the exact opposite from my way of thinking of what we should be doing. I think the lack of parental involvement in their child's lives is maybe what causes some of these other problems that may lead to suicide. And it may all start with as simple as child just wants to change their name. And we didn't let the parents know. We didn't let the parents know. They didn't know that their child was heading towards suicide because the school didn't bother to notify them because the law is going to say the school can't or the school isn't going to notify the parents.
It's not only deceiving their family, it teaches them they don't need to speak with their family. That's the wrong way to go. It's teaching our children that they don't need to communicate with their family. So now we're closing doors on communication. We're not encouraging it, we're discouraging it. We encourage children to keep things from their parents and the school to help them out. So that in my mind, the school becomes complicit. They become complicit in this. Case of my own child, I didn't have any issue with her changing her name from Katie to KT. <laughs> Even though her middle name does not start with a T, which I reminded her. I didn't have any issue with that. What I was grateful for is that the school notified me to let me know. You know, she's in here demanding. I'm like, of course she is. She's my daughter. <laughs> it's like, you know, she got me out of a boardroom, out of a board meeting, because it was that important to her. And I was happy to listen to her. And to this day, she doesn't go by her given name of Catherine. She goes by Katie everywhere. And that's okay but it also further strengthened our relationship by the school not notifying the parents it puts it puts a hindrance on that relationship it means that the child's like they're lacking in communication where we could have started a communication going it's not happening now why well, we didn't give the parents a chance to know that they needed to maybe listen better or have some more discussions with their own child, we stopped that. That's not happening. I just want you to start thinking about what kind of impact this can have on the family and on those parents. Can you imagine, even if the child changes their name, has their own chosen name, they don't tell their parents, their parents didn't know anything about it, and then the child does commit suicide, and that the funeral is where they find out that their child was going by a different name? Do you imagine what those parents are thinking? God, if I'd had only known, if I'd had only known that my child was reaching out and the school didn't let me know, but if I would have known my child was reaching out, I could have made a difference? This bill, because we didn't put in the notification to parents, is denying them their ability to maybe save that child, to save their child, their child. I ask for a no vote on House Bill 1039. Senator Henriksen. Thank you, Madam Chair. I am quite confident that I am about to get emotional, which I hate doing, especially in public. So. Let's get through this. I have had a couple of young constituents call me in the past few days <clears throat> asking me to support this bill. And I do support this bill. So I had planned on simply assuring them of my support, listening to the debate, voting yes, and co-sponsoring it because I support it as a matter of philosophical principle and yeah, civil liberty, and I support it as a matter of conviction that sound policy is one that is informed by science. Thank you. But I also know that today they're listening to us. And a couple of days ago on a different bill regarding an entirely different issue, I was reminded by my friends and colleagues from Greenwood Village and Northwest Denver that beyond the philosophy, beyond the silence, the science, beyond the black letters on white paper is a human element and a human story. And I realize that while I can and will vote for the policy, the human element can only really be affirmed by speaking to it. I believe in civil liberties, 
I believe in the right to self-expression that does not infringe on the rights of others. On those fronts, philosophically, this bill is a no-brainer to me. There is a litany of science that has now, through the wonders of our incredible research capabilities, identified the specific gene variants that directly inform the divergent manners in which individuals relate to their own sense of gender and sexuality. In short, science affirms the immortal words of Lady Gaga, baby, I was born this way. We've heard arguments about parental rights, and I firmly believe in the rights of parents to guide the upbringing, the behavior, and the morality of their children. But no parent, well-intended or otherwise, can guide their child's biology. I'm reminded of a time when it was common for parents and schools to mandate that children write with their right hand. So on the basis of following the science and the development of sound policy, I'm there. But then there are the kids who reach out to me, kids with hopefully lengthy and fulfilling lives ahead of them, kids who will go on to careers that may serve others or further enhance our understanding of how the world around us works or advance the frontiers of enterprise and entrepreneurship. Much of their lives, like much of our lives, will be filled with work and mundanity. Most of our waking hours are spent working. We're chasing that school project. We're chasing that work deadline. We're doing the chores. We're taking care of our kids. We're taking care of our parents. We're trying to get to the honey-do list, and once we're there, we're trying to make as deep of inroads on that list as we can. And as with our lives, it is in the short moments and in the small things where they'll find purpose meaning, and beauty. And so they'll fill the voids between work and responsibilities of life with art, music, athleticism, adventure, dance, and the pursuit of knowledge simply for the sake of enriching their minds. These interests and endeavors will change over time. Maybe, like me, you'll discover that actually you have absolutely no musical talent whatsoever. You'll give it up. But because of that experience, you'll have a deeper appreciation for those who do it well. Maybe you'll scoff at those who ride motorcycles and think of them as ridiculously irresponsible until, dared by a friend, you take a ride and are shocked at the liberating sense of connectedness between man and machine and the thin strands that cross God's creation and connect communities. Whatever your thing is or isn't, the search and the experiences and the people you meet will shape you and change you and lead you to a better understanding of yourself. But deeper than the hobbies lies that which is existential. Our search to understand how we relate to others. Our journey to know those who are close to us, our search to understand how we experience love. Taylor Swift once said of one of her albums that she wrote the lyrics, that she wrote the lyrics of it, for all of us who have tossed and turned and decided to keep the lanterns lit and go searching, hoping that just maybe when the clock strikes 12, we'll meet ourselves. Meeting yourself can be really scary. We all, in our own ways, have significant flaws and shortcomings. If you truly see yourself, you'll see those. We all, all, in our own ways, are really pretty weird. If you truly see yourself, you'll see that. We all, in our own ways, have unique and innate beauty. If you truly see yourself, you will see your innate beauty. <clears throat> I believe that everybody should be able to search for themselves fearlessly and, having found themselves, be seen and accepted by others. This isn't always the case. We tend to be unkind to that which we're not familiar with and those who are different than us. 
and that rejection keeps us from fearlessly endeavoring to discover ourselves. Because we cut people down, we focus on each other's flaws, and we deride and minimize the differences between us that are actually beautiful. Nothing that we do here can solve for that. We're often reminded by the good senator from Monument that culture and politics inform one another, but neither can ever subsume the other. The power to see and accept others for who they are will always reside in the hearts of every individual Coloradan, regardless of what we do here today. We cannot make anybody see the innate beauty in someone else when that beauty is different than our own. But what House Bill 24 1039 does is shine a light on that beauty so that while some may choose to look away, it cannot remain hidden away from view. And Gwen, and Michaela, there are many who see you and love you and accept you. You add to the beauty and richness of our community by living as your authentic self. I hope you appreciate the Lady Gaga and Taylor Swift references. You are the far more important reason why I support House Bill 24-1039. Senator Liston. Thank you, Madam Chair. I won't need the Kleenex. Um, members, uh, and we wonder why our public schools are going downhill. You know, when I, when I see this piece of legislation that is brought to us by, uh, no offense, this COAC, I didn't realize that the 15, 16 year olds were so powerful. Uh, COAC brought this piece of legislation. Um, and um, I thought that's why we had school boards. I thought the school boards were in control of the local school districts. But apparently not. We have uh, unelected uh, 14, 15, 16-year-olds from Lord knows wherever that have approached uh, a handful of legislators on a social engineering. Senator Liston, I'm going to implore you to not impugn the, the motives of uh, the members of COYAC or the sponsors of this bill. Well, okay, Please proceed. okay, Madam Chair. Okay, well, I. I uh, I can't believe that COAC represents the vast majority of the students in our public schools. I, I just am blown away of how powerful a small group of students that I have no idea and the public has no idea who these 14, 15, and 16-year-old students are that somehow have immense power to come and bring a piece of legislation that totally undermines the uh, parent-student uh, uh, relationship. Uh, and I, uh, I believe this is going to further uh, erode and undermine our public schools. Basically, uh, what COAC and what others want, there'll be no rules, no standards, no trust, no communication between the parents and the students uh, because they have their little problems. Um, Senator members, Liston, I'm members, going to again. Uh, Senator members, Liston, what this is going to do? Senator Liston, I'm going. What to, this is going to do, members? Is Senator this Liston, ma'am. Senator uh, Liston, I have a right to speak. Senator Liston, just because you don't like it, Madam Chair. Senator Liston, mm -hmm. I'm asking you to speak to the actual language in House Bill 1039. Mm -hmm. Get back to the bill. Thank you. Please proceed. Uh, what members, what this is going to do, this is going to, mark my words, this is going to undermine our public schools. Uh, there are going to be parents, when they find out what the true implications are of this bill, th there is going to be further erosion and people, uh, parents, are going to take their kids out of public schools. Uh, this will be a boom for the homeschool movement, boom for private schools. Uh, uh, I, this is a misguided, mis, uh, uh, totally uh, uh, outrageous piece of legislation. 
I urge a no vote on House Bill 1039. This is going to destroy public schools. Thank you. Senator Colker. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> I stand in strong support of HB 1039 for many reasons. The first is based on mutual respect and a personal experience. I had a good friend growing up. As a kid, we all called him by a certain name, a name that wasn't his given name. I remember since the second grade, his teacher put that name on his nameplate. That's what everyone called him. It's what he wanted to be called. Until years later, when he asked to be called by his given name or his his formal name. For 20 years, I called him by his, his kid's name, his youth name. And it was hard to adjust. It wasn't easy. But I had to break that habit because I abided by his request out of mutual respect. You see, calling a person by their chosen name isn't just about saying their name correctly. It is about respecting the person. It is about treating others like I want to be treated, about mutual respect. You see, he didn't get teased or bullied about his name because it wasn't about gender identity, which is what this bill explicitly says. The strike below on line seven through nine, page one, if you haven't read it, it says chosen name means any name that a student requests to be known as that differs from the student's legal name to reflect the student's gender identity. This bill is also about allowing local education providers the opportunity to implement a written policy on how they will honor a student's request. Lines 35 through 39, page one of the strike below. It is about local control and how they will implement that request. They may involve school counselors. They may involve parents. This measure affords communities the flexibility to adapt their procedures to best meet individual needs at a local level level. I am for this bill because it is not about irreversible physical changes. It is not about afflictions, trans craze, or whims, which are arguments we heard in committee. It is about protecting students from institutional bullying, from bullying by those who should know better adult employees of school districts. It is about reducing suicide ideation, reducing suicide and the mental health of our LGBTQ plus students. If you are for increasing the mental health of our students, you are for this bill. It is about our ability to support students in living their truest self. For these reasons, I urge an I vote on 1039. Thank you. Senator Rich. Thank you, Madam Chair. And um, I really appreciate what I've been hearing. And uh, I certainly appreciate uh, the good senator from Pueblo who quoted Lady Gaga. Taylor Swift. I like them both. But I'm going to quote something from the Bible, and it has to do with the Ten Commandments. And in that top ten list of the most important laws that God brought to us is number five. Honor your father and your mother. In Exodus 20, 12, honor your father and your mother that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord, your God, is giving you. 
In Ephesians 6, 2, the Apostle Paul says about <clears throat> the fifth um, commandment, this is the first commandment with promise, and God will not go back on his promise. Children owe their parents love, obedience, respect, and helpfulness. And in 2 Timothy 3, 1 and 2, think of happiness that obedience to this commandment would bring to thousands of homes today. Then every day would be Mother's Day. Every day would be Father's Day. Honor your father and your mother. Disobedience to parents is one of the omnibus signs of the last days, according to 2 Timothy 3.1.2. All I have ever wanted about this bill, because I respect the children's rights, but all I have ever wanted about this bill since it was introduced in Koyak is to notify the parents. That's not asking a whole lot. They should be part of the conversation. And if they're not, that is the reason I cannot support this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Rich. C Senator Buckner. Thank you. Um, when I sat in education committee and listened to the testimony about this bill, my focus was on the students who came and really listening to them and hearing their voices. And what I will never forget is those students, when I asked them if their parents would accept or acknowledge what they were going through and what they wanted to be called, every student on the panel said, my parents will not accept it. I want to protect young people. And I also want every child to feel like they are seen or heard. That's all these kids want. They want to be seen or heard. And even those kids whose parents will not acknowledge this, they still said, my parents love us. We love them, but I want to be seen and I want to be heard. And what this makes me think about is my cousin Robbie. This happened over 50 years ago. I had a cousin, Robbie. Robbie's birth name was Roberta. We were in church every Sunday together. He obeyed his parents. He was a Christian. But he said he felt like Roberta. In Sunday school, he would talk about this like, I want to obey my parents. And that's what I keep thinking about is what so many of these kids are going through. You know, times have changed. And I'm one of the oldest people in this chamber, and I'm kind of hip, which tells you how old I am <laughs> by using that terminology. But times have changed. And the statistics tell us that 82% of transgender people have considered suicide. 40% have attempted, but this rate is reduced when their chosen names or pronouns are respected, just like my cousin Robbie, Roberta. I'm a Christian, I believe in obeying thy mother and father. And that's what these kids are saying. We want to obey our mothers and fathers, but we also want to do what we have to do to stay alive. 
and I might be trying to make this more simplistic than it is, but I'm just speaking from my heart. I'm speaking the truth. And if this is what it takes to save lives, then to me, that is a small ask. So I am in strong support of this bill. Senator Winter. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I want to address just a few of the comments. Uh, saying that our education system and our schools needs to focus on educational outcomes, if you're in school not being accepted, you're not going to go to school. You're not going to go to class. You're not going to show up. You aren't going to be thinking about that trigonometry problem. We aren't going to increase the outcomes of our schools until we start teaching the whole student and accepting the whole student. So this is about educational outcomes, absolutely. And I know that a lot of the conversations we've had today have been about parents. We had many parents come testify who talked about how hard they had fought alongside their child to get their correct name used. I talked to one mom recently who said every single time they start a new school year and they say, no, this is my name, but they get dead named by the educators, they have to relive that trauma. They have to answer the questions from their peers again. They have to answer questions from their teachers again. And making folks relive their trauma day in and day out because we refuse to use a name, that's not access to education. It is time to accept our children and save their lives. This is about lives. This is about suicide. This is about them feeling seen and heard. And this is about our community accepting folks and making sure we're keeping them safe. Seeing no further discussion, the motion is the adoption of House Bill 1039. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. no. The ayes have it. 1039 is adopted. <laughs> Majority Leader Rodriguez. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move the committee rise and report. The motion is to rise and report. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. no. The ayes have it. We will rise and report.
The Senate will come to order. Senator Gonzalez. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Uh, we, uh, let's see, we met and uh, considered House Bill 1039. Mr. Hubler, will you please read the report? March 28, 2024, Mr. President, your committee of the whole begs leave to report it as had under consideration the following attached bill being the second reading thereof and makes the following recommendations thereon. House Bill 1039 is amended, passed on second reading and ordered revised and placed on the calendar for third reading and final passage. Senator Gonzalez. Thank you, Mr. President. I move for adoption of the committee report. Motion is the adoption of the committee of the whole report. There is an amendment at the desk. Will the clerk please read Cow Amendment 1. Cow Amendment 1. Senator Rich, move to amend the report of the committee of the whole. Thank you, Mr. President. I move uh, Cow Amendment S. 001. To the amendment. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, we had a spirited debate on House Bill 1039, and I certainly appreciated that. Um, this amendment that I brought forward was about giving the parents notice, giving it to them in writing, and seeking their permission. It was just out of respect for their position as the parent of that child. And I ask for an I vote. Is there any further discussion? Senator Marchman. Thank you, Mr. President. And I rise in opposition to Cal Amendment S001. As it is now, local school districts will have the ability to put in place whatever parental notification that they'd like to. So this amendment is not required to get to what the good senator from Mesa wants to do. So I'd ask for your no vote on Cal Amendment S001. Is there any further discussion? See none. The motion before the body is the adoption of S001. Are there any no votes? <clears throat> Senators Mollica, Exum, Gonzalez, Coleman, Colker, Majority Leader Rodriguez, Marchman, Winter, Hansen, Danielson, Janal. Bridges, Zenzinger, Henriksen, Sullivan, Hawkes Lewis, Cutter, Michelson Janae, Buckner, Priola. Fields. Please have the president. With a vote of 13 ayes, 22 noes, zero absence, zero excuse, the amendment is lost. There's another amendment at the desk. Will the clerk please read Cow Amendment 2? Amendment 2, Senator Rich moves to amend the report of the committee of the whole to show Senator the following. Rich. Thank you, Mr. President. I move uh, Cow Amendment 002. To the amendment. Thank you, Mr. President. This one is very similar to the one, first one that you just for, heard, except for the fact that all it, this one is requesting is that the schools notify the parents that the child wishes to use a name other, a, a, other than their given name. They're not asking for permission. They're just giving notification. 
and it would be given in uh, writing, and um, it's just a way to keep the parent involved in the student's life and what's going on with them. They are the ones that are raising them, and I ask for an I vote on this. Senator Winter. Thank you, Mr. President. I urge a no vote on this amendment. Um, again, we really believe that these policies are best left to our local control school districts. If a school district wants to set this policy, they can. If they don't, they don't need to. Um, this is uh, left to the districts themselves. And I personally don't agree with this amendment because the entire point of this bill is to ensure that our children and our students feel safe, they have access to education, they feel affirmed, they feel seen, and if they are know that they're unsupportive parents, they're potentially abusive parents, their parents that might kick them out of the house will be notified, they're not going to come forward. They're not going to feel that affirmation. And I understand that parents want to know this, but not everyone lives in a happy and healthy household. If you have a good relationship, you're going to be told. But there's bad relationships. And we want to ensure we're creating the spaces for children to come forward um, and be affirmed and reduce suicide rates. And this amendment does not help that. The motion before the body is the adoption of Cal Amendment 2. Are there any no votes? Senators Coleman, Exum, Mollica, Hansen, Marchman, Majority Leader Rodriguez, Kolker, Gonzalez, Janal, Winter, Zenzinger, Bridges, Sullivan, Hakas Lewis, Danielson. Michael Sinjane, Cutter, Henriksen, Fields, Priola, Buckner. Please have the president. With a vote of 13 ayes, 22 noes, zero absent, zero excused, the amendment is lost. There's another amendment at the desk. Will the clerk please read Cal Amendment 3? Amendment 3, Senator Van Winkle, move to amend the report of the committee. Thank you, Mr. President. I move Senate uh, Cal Amendment 3. To the amendment. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. This is one sentence only. It says, upon a student's request to be addressed by a chosen name, the public school must notify the, parents, the student's parents or legal guardian. Very simple. It's the very least we can do for parents who have rights and who are uh, the, uh, well, it's the very least we can do for parents is simply to notify them. Thank you. So, Senator Winter. Thank you, Mr. President. For all the reasons mentioned on the last two amendments, we urge no vote. See no further discussion. The motion before the body is the adoption of Amendment 3 to the Committee of the Whole Report. Are there any no votes? Senators Hansen, Roberts, Mollica, Exum, Coleman, Gonzalez. Janal, Zenzinger, Danielson, Sullivan, Hakez Lewis, Michael Sinjane, Cutter, Henriksen, Marchman, Kolker, Majority Leader Rodriguez, Winter, Fields, Priola, Buckner, Bridges. Please add the president. With a vote of 12 ayes, 23 noes, 0 absent, 0 excuse, the amendment is lost. The motion before the body is the adoption of the Committee of the Whole Report. Are there any yes votes? Are there any no, are there any no votes? Senators Van Winkle, Baisley, Will, Rich. Gardner, Minority Leader Lundeen, Smallwood, Kirkmeyer, Liston, 
Pelton B. Pelton R. Simpson. With a vote of 23 ayes, 12 noes, 0 absent, 0 excused, committee of the whole report is adopted. House Bill 1039 is amended, passed in second reading in order, revised, and placed on the calendar for third reading and final passage. Consideration of resolutions. Will the clerk please read the title to Senate Resolution 4? Senate Resolution 4 by Senators Cutter and Fields concerning the effort to acknowledge and enshrine in the Constitution the rights of women in the United States. Senator Cutter. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I move Senate Resolution 004. Im Senator Cutter. Imagine a world or a country in which women and men were paid equally for the work they do. Imagine a country in which LGBTQ plus individuals were actually protected against discrimination because of who they are. And imagine a world where our rights are not infringed upon because we are considered inferior. That's what the Equal Rights Amendment will ensure. Section one of the amendment states that the equality of rights under the law shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on the account of sex. That is what we continue to fight for. Last summer was the 100th anniversary of the first introduction of the Equal Rights Amendment in Congress. But today, the rights we as a society have relied on to protect women and the LGBTQIA community are being rolled back. The Dobbs decision shows that a majority of our Supreme Court interprets that Constitution solely through the lens of those who are alive when its provisions were adopted at a time before women and people of color could vote, own land, or otherwise live as free individuals. To expand the meaning of the Constitution, we need to amend it. That is why we need the ERA, which provides an explicit prohibi prohibition against discrimination on the basis of sex. The ERA would provide additional protections that would protect against sex-based violence and discrimination in legislation and the enforcement of laws, combat discrimination in government employment, including in education, law enforcement, and the military, give Congress increased power to protect against unequal pay, workplace harassment, pregnancy discrimination, and crimes against women, girls, and LGBTQ plus people, and provide a new basis for congressional action to protect reproductive health care, pre- and postnatal care, and contraceptives. For nearly a century, women have been fighting for the passage of the ERA. In 2019, the movement scored a historic victory when Virginia became the 38th and final state required to ratify the amendment. There's nothing in Article 5 that talks about a time limit. And for the first 150 years or so of our republic, there were no time limits on proposed amendments. In fact, the last amendment proposed by James Madison added to the Constitution, the 27th Amendment, took 203 years to ratify. It was proposed by James Madison and became part of the Constitution only recently. Incidents of violence, harassment, and assault towards young women has increased dramatically, along with the rise of suicide and depression. I want all of our young women and trans and LGBTQIA plus youth growing up knowing their rights are protected and they have value as a human being and the respect of society. I want my children and grandchildren and yours to grow up in a world where women and men are paid equally for the work they do and where the rights of LGBTQIA plus and trans folks are protected by law. It is unfathomable to me that some are still fighting the adoption of this amendment. It is time to pass the ERA. Seeing no further discussion, the motion before the body is the adoption of Senate Resolution 4. Are there any no votes? Senators Baisley, Van Winkle, Rich, Minority Leader Lundeen, Smallwood, 
Pelton B. So passionate. Pelton R. So well. Liston. Simpson. Will. Gardner. With a vote of 24 ayes, 11 noes, zero absent, zero excused, the resolution is adopted. <laughs> Co-sponsors. Senators Roberts, Janal, Gonzalez, Priola, Exum, Mullica, Majority Leader Rodriguez, Winter, Marchman, Bridges, Henriksen, Sullivan, Danielson, Jaquez Lewis, Buckner, Michelson Janae, Hansen, Coleman, please add the president. Signing the bills. March 26, 2024, the president signed House Bills 1013, 1035, 1041, 1067, 1086, 1103, 1139, 1155, and House Joint Resolution 1020. March 28, 2024, the president has signed Senate Bill 17, 71, 74, 79, 93, and 105. Delivery to the governor. March 28, 2024, to the governor for signature on Thursday, March 28, 2024, at 11:10 a.m., Senate Bill 17, 71, 74, 79, 93, and 105. Majority Leader Rodriguez. Colleagues, I ask everybody's attention for this one. Um, Mr. President, I move the balance of the calendar for Friday, March 29th, layover until Monday, April 1st, 2024. The motion is to lay over the balance of the calendar on of Friday, March 29th to Monday, April 1st. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. The ayes have it. The balance of the calendar of Friday, March 29th will lay over until Monday, April 1st, 2024. Further announcements. Senator Danielson. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, the Senate Business, Labor, and Technology Committee will meet on adjournment um, in the old Supreme Court, but quick after this, like a quarter till. Um, and we'll be hearing the four bills that are listed on the calendar. I hope everybody has a great long weekend. Take care. Senator Mullica. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Members, Senate Finance Committee will meet here in 15 minutes upon adjournment uh, in 357 to hear Senate Bill 180 and House Bill 1002. Senator Fields. Thank you, Mr. President. Members of the Senate Health and Human Services Committee, we will be meeting at 1.30. We have several bills for consideration. Um, the calendar is accurate, and we do have uh, two confirmation hearings. So see you at 1.30. Senator Exum. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Senate Local Government and Housing Committee will meet 15 minutes upon adjournment to hear Senate Bill 179. Uh, House Bill 1275 and Senate Bill 183 in room 352. Thank you. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr. President. Agriculture and Natural Resources Committee, we are meeting today at 1.30 or whenever the business committee wraps up because we are in the old Supreme Court building, not our normal room. We're in the old Supreme Court to hear one bill, Senate Bill 159. S Senator Sullivan. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, the uh, Senate and State and Veterans and Military Affairs Committee, we will be meeting um, after the upon adjournment um, committees are meeting in um, room 352. We will be hearing one bill, and that is uh, House Bill 1150. Senator Smallwood. Um, thank you, Mr. President. In a shockingly disappointing, bipartisan, enthusiastic manner. Yourself, the majority leader, and the minority leader have approved me 
being excused on the afternoon of Monday, April 1st. Objection. As long as you spend that day off reading statute. In, in the privacy of your own home, of course. Senator Gardner. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, April 1st is the day for April Fool's jokes, and this is an April Fool's joke of its own on everyone. I request to be excused all day Monday, April 1st. Uh, and, and since I was only excused for the entire month of March, I need to ask for April once again. Uh, I've spoken with the minority leader. The majority leader, I, I don't think he cares. And uh, Mr. President may object vociferously, I don't know. Senator Gardner will be excused for the rest of session. <laughs> Unless he shows up. <clears throat> Senator Fields. Senator Fields. Thank you, Mr. President. Members of the Health and Human Services Committee, we will not be hearing Senate Bill 61. Mr. Majority Leader. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that the Senate recess until 12 o'clock today. Colleagues, you do not need to return. We just got to read some bills and stuff across the desk. 12 o'clock would be in the past, so we're going to need a time that's in the future. 1 p.m. <laughs> 1 p.m. 1 p.m. That's true. We could make it five days ago. Uh, you have heard the motion. All those in favor say aye. Opposed, no. The ayes just barely have it, and the Senate will stand in recess until 1 p.m. today.